Zoom, so I'm going to broadcast. And we'll allow the attendees to come in. Hi, Riley. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Welcome to the December 3rd uh, board business and conference meeting of the school district of Haverford Township. Um, and we all pretend to rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and to the stands. public for which it stands. One, One nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Mr. Regal, could you call her all, please? Dr. Crispin? Here. Mr. Fleischer? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Minji? Here. Mr. Sinto? Here. Mr. Schwartz? Here. Ms. Snodgrass? Here. Ms. Wiedemann? Here. And Mr. Feinberg. Here, thank you, Bob. I hope uh, everybody had the best Thanksgiving possible under the circumstances. Um, we're happy tonight to have uh, our National Merit Scholars uh, joining us on the meeting. So uh, welcome um, to, to all of those folks and uh, uh, we'll be getting to them, uh, recognition for them uh, not too, not too distant. Uh, first item on the agenda is uh, I'll accept the motion to approve the official minutes from the November 19th, 2020 regular public board meeting. Sinto moves. We get a second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. I'll accept the motion to approve the official minutes from the November 23rd, 2020 special public board meeting. Person moved. Don Grass second. Moved and second, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Next item is public comment. Anna, what do you have for us this evening? We have four comments this evening, Mr. Feinberg. So the, um, the first comment was a letter that was sent um, from several people to the board. Uh, three three of, the, of, of those um, residents have asked to be identified and asked to read the letter. It's the same letter. Um, the first resident is Alexis Pasternak at 609 Woodland Drive, Havertown, PA. The second resident is Alberto Robayo at 521 East Manoa Road. And the third resident is Michael Murain, Mur Murnain, sorry, at 1107 Garfield Avenue, Havertown, PA. Dear School District of Haverford Township, we as taxpayers and concerned residents are seeking to have the children of the Haverford School District educated. We desire to have the students learn their ABCs and 123s. Mathematics, reading, writing, science, and history are crucial to creating critical thinkers. Encouraging children to ask questions is necessary to encourage learning. In public education, we understand that kindness, inclusivity, and equity matter, but the children of the Haverford School District need to be educated, not indoctrinated. Your policies in recent years have been harmful to some students and have, in fact, not been kind, inclusive, nor equitable. Your belonging and social cultural identities in schools basis program has strong ties in political theories and agendas. We do not believe all of these theories are developmentally appropriate for children. They are not settled wisdom, nor do we appreciate that, they're, that not all views are being incorporated into the curriculum. As a district moves to fast track the basis program, we desire to have detailed information and transparency, transparency to your current agenda. 
a group of parents was chosen to be on a panel group for the parent guardian equity team. The, these parent guardian names should be shared with the community. The breakdown of each parent who signed up to participate in the group needs to be publicly provided. The number of funds being spent on the basis program need to be described in detail and shown to the public. Our children are not being educated. What is now occurring in the school district K to 12 is redirecting our children away from basic academics and towards an academic environment of learning that is divisive and destructive. We want our children to go back to the basics where kindness, where kindness and what unifies us matters. Please leave the parents to teach their children values. Thank you. Our second comment is from Shana Miser at 160 Friendship Road. Dear Dr. Rishi and members of the board, at the November 19th meeting, when Dr. Brennan spoke about the current pandemic, he clearly stated that he did not see conditions improving and that he expected to see more in-school transmissions as we see more transmissions in the community. He noted that it was appropriate to move to virtual learning and further stated it makes the most sense to return after New Year's and perhaps toward the middle of January. While he did make some allowance to consider in-person learning for elementary students, he strongly indicated that he felt middle and high school students should be best served with virtual learning. He also clearly stated that he anticipated that any Thanksgiving related increase would take two to three weeks to materialize. Dr. Brennan stated there is not testing capacity to keep schools open and there is more strain on commercial laboratories. Dr. Brennan also reflected that the community transmission would impact the ability of staff to do contact tracing. He concluded by noting that our teachers may have conditions that put them at risk. If the board decides to ignore the expert recommendations of Dr. Brennan, I hope members are, clear, are able to clearly share with the community why they are disregarding his recommendations. I implore the board to take responsibility and to ensure that schools will work with families who choose to listen to Dr. Brennan and other infectious disease experts and who conclude that it is not safe to have their children in school in the short term during this current surge. Currently, elementary principals have indicated that students should either move to HOL, which may be Pearson depending on grade level, or continue to come to school. Those students who are not present in school on their assigned in-school learning days are told they cannot attend those days virtually via Zoom. Furthermore, students are told not to plan to attend on their assigned Zoom day either. The rationale for not permitting students to Zoom in the classes, even on days where they were previously remote in the hybrid model, is that by not coming into school, the students cannot collect materials prepared by their teachers. Asking teachers to leave such materials or pick up would be an extra burden on them. There is no doubt that teachers are working extremely hard during this challenging time, and I see no need to burden them further. However, students whose parents feel that in-school learning has grown unsafe in the short term should not be burdened with absenteeism. Surely there is a workable solution such as uploading documents in Canvas. Hopefully the board recognizes that many families who opted for hybrid learning did so in good faith, considering carefully the district's publicly stated plan to respond to specific community thresholds as presented in the summer. Forcing those students into HOL with new teachers or possibly with no H HTSD teacher until this current surge is over or until numbers return to thresholds presented in the summer is disruptive and detrimental to learning and unfair. A fair solution since the district has been flexible in its stated plans would be for the district to be similarly flexible in this regard, to at least allow students at all levels to zoom into classes when possible on their originally assigned virtual days until the current surge subsides. Thank you. Our next um, comment is from Catherine Wang at 16 Tenby Road. While the school board has done an amazing job and devoted countless hours to addressing the COVID related school issues this year, the public cannot expect these elected, these elected volunteers to continue to analyze in real time the rapidly changing guidelines, data, and other information that must go into each day and every decision regarding school openings and closures and other related concerns. The superintendent has demonstrated her professionalism and clear ability to make well-informed measured, measured decisions in the best interest of students, teachers, and staff. The ongoing pandemic requires often quick action, which can be best accomplished without requiring, but still permitting the school board's organized input and formal vote for each and every decision. I am in favor of adopting the proposed changes to the safety plan. Our last public comment is from Marianne Butera at 17 Woodcroft Road. Dear elected board members, I am disappointed in the school district's SD overall handling of the Delaware County's reassessment in comparison to the surrounding school district's responses. The board has chosen to allow attorneys, appraisers, and others who likely have interest in this reassessment 
to dictate how you vote regardless of the fact that appeals of our homes are unjust. You have unfairly targeted us because we recently purchased our homes when there are thousands of other homes in Hereford Township that are grossly underassessed by as much as, if not more than we. Some of your own properties are not assessed at fair market value. Underassessed by tens of thousands of dollars, but, you, but did you appeal your own home values in the name of fairness and equity? According to public record, 2720 Pine Valley Lane in Ardmore sold in December for, in 2019 for 525,000, yet is reassessed at $491,850. Furthermore, I spoke with the school district's attorney, Mr. Scott Cattell on October 27th regarding the appeals. Mr. Cattell was kind enough to spend over 20 minutes on the phone with me. He stated that he empathizes with us, but perhaps what is most telling about my conversation with him is his statement, I would be pissed off if this were me. This is concerning because there would be no reason for him to be pissed if this was a fair appeal. Again, I have no issue with being assessed at fair market value if the majority of properties are, but data has shown this is not the case. In fact, as you're well aware, the school district's expert appraiser has analyzed and reassessment and has generated a coefficient of dispersion that is close to rendering the entire reassessment is flawed, but yet you have targeted a limited number of recent sales based on one of the arbitrary formulas of the school district used to appeal and have done so in the midst of a worldwide pandemic when people are struggling to make ends meet. Given the widespread issues with the reassessment across the county, we were forced to pay thousands more per year while our neighbors who had similar homes and FMVs were paying thousands less just because they did not purchase recently. This is one of the reasons the township retracted their appeals of recent sales, as one commissioner disclosed, it was, it was an unjust process that we don't want to be part of. However, taxpayers should know that, that given the township's withdrawal, the SD will now incur all the legal costs from this battle. I'm sure you can find more appropriate ways to spend our hard-earned tax dollars, perhaps on the education of our children. Furthermore, it's concerning that Mr. Greg Parker serves as full-time general counsel and human resource director and is compensated over $190,000 annually, but when questioned about his legal capacities within the district, Dr. Arushi's response indicated that Mr. Parker does not really serve as general counsel. Moreover, Mr. Parker has been a full-time employee of the school district since 2012, but according to page 46 of the County of Delaware Judicial Report, 2013 to 15, Mr. Parker himself served as a criminal master and heard 139 bail hearings in 2013, 168 bail hearings in 2014, 160 bail hearings in 2015, all by video conferencing. He also heard 1,565 Gannon II hearings in 2013, of which 375 were by video conferencing, 1,628 hearings in 2014, of which 433 were by video conferencing, and 1,855 hearings in 2015, which 486 were by video conferencing. This is quite a feat and leaves one to question how Mr. Parker was able to accomplish this while he was a full-time employee of our school district. The inefficient use of taxpayer dollars at the board's discretion, among other concerns touched upon this correspondence, will continue to be pursued. Purchasing a home that we worked hard for was one of our proudest accomplishments. Words cannot describe the amount of stress that your actions and lack of ability to fulfill your professional obligation in regard to having an understanding of a matter prior to voting on it has caused us. Because of this, I truly question your ability to govern our school district effectively when without reservation, you he did the advice of, of SD business manager, Rob Regal and SD general counsel, Greg Parker, who told the board that he had no intimate knowledge of the appeals process, yet he represented the school district in prior appeal cases. Your negligence and refusal to apply the law and how it's written has caused us significant stress, knowing we will be forced to manage and a substantial increase to our mortgage and assume the tax burden of thousands of other under assessed properties. The emotional toll this has taken on us that has been targeted by you is unimaginable. And for that, you are responsible, given you know this is not a fair process, but you continue to proceed regardless. Thank you, Mr. Feinberg. That is all for this evening. Thank you, Anna. Next item on our agenda is uh, our student reports. We have Zoe Starr from the middle school and Katie Bongiovanni from the high school. Zoe? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Zoe Starr, and I help out with the morning announcements at the middle school. I would like to thank the board for allowing me to present to them. Our school community is supporting the CHOP toy drive again this year. CHOP has a different pro process this year due to the pandemic. They have an Amazon link set up where people can purchase recommended toys for kids and have them delivered directly to CHOP. The ordering information was shared in the HMS weekly newsletter and is open until Friday, December 11th. 
I hope that if we are able to return to school, we will be able to put on happy faces and remember that this will not last forever. We need to remember the good things. As a student, I try to remind myself when I am at home doing virtual learning that all of my friends and my family are the, in, in the exact same position as I am. And I remember that we are still a community. Even though the situation we are in now prevents us from having social contact, we should all keep trying to spread kindness in our community especially to ones who need it the most. We should also wear masks so we don't spread anything else. That's about it for my announcements. It was pretty short, but we don't have a lot going on. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you to the board for allowing me to present to them. Thank you, Joey. Thanks for your uplifting presentation and I can tell you that the board has been trying to keep our happy faces on for the last nine months too. So we appreciate hearing that from you. Katie. Hello, my name is Katie Bongiovanni and I'm a senior at Haverford High School. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present to you tonight about the exciting things happening at Haverford. The week leading up to Thanksgiving break certainly looked different than in years past, but Haverford was full of school spirit. Students dressed up each day for Spirit Week, and Student Senate and class officers worked with administrators to plan a fun pep rally for seniors on Wednesday. Seniors were spread out six feet apart across the field as we sang along to Mr. Mullen's guitar and cheered for Erica Borby and Ryan Wellington as they were crowned homecoming royalty for the class of 2021. Seniors who participated in the annual tradition of painting Haverford-themed jeans showed them off after having a blast painting them outside with friends the week before. Although we couldn't have our annual dance, powder puff game, or bonfire, Haverford students showed off their school spirit in creative and safe ways. The football season wrapped up without the annual Thanksgiving Day game against Upper Darby and with an unfortunate loss to Strathaven on Saturday. But we are incredibly proud of the hard work and dedication the Fords exemplified this season. Winter athletes are gearing up for an unforgettable season and are already demonstrating their resilience and adapting to the changing schedules and restrictions. We cannot wait to see all that they accomplish and they are all excited to get back in the pool, on the mat, on the court, and on the ice. In other team news, Haverford's award-winning high-Q team kicked off their 73rd season over Zoom. It is exciting to see Haverford's clubs and groups continue to do what they love with their peers, even if the ways they do it have to change. With all that is going on, Haverford students are doing what they can to help others. The National Honor Society pie sale was a success once again, the pies making a delicious addition to people's Thanksgiving dinners, and the proceeds going to the NHS gift drive. National Honor Society is working hard to once again brighten families' holiday seasons with gifts, and Student Senate and Girl Up are working together to provide toiletries and menstrual products to families in need. Future Business Leaders of America and National Business Honor Society have partnered to sell masks as a fundraiser for their clubs and for the American Heart Association. Haverford students show time and time again their passion for helping others, even during these uncertain times. This is a challenging time for everyone, but Haverford students are making the most of it in their Zoom classes, competitions, and community service. As conditions evolve, it is exciting to see how the Fords change with them and all that we can accomplish with H Pride. Thank you again for having me here to present tonight. Thank you very much, Katie. It's a pleasure to have our National Merit Scholars with us this evening. Dr. Rushi. Mr. Feinberg, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Donaghy. Thank you, Dr. Rushi, Mr. Feinberg. It's, it's, it's nice to go after uh, Zoe and Katie instead of Dr. Brennan for once at a board <laughs> meeting. Uh, they started off the board meeting on a high note, which is good. Uh, but with me tonight, we have uh, some of our 18 uh, National Merit Commended uh, and Semifinalist. Uh, National Merit Commended and Semifinalist, 1.5 million students across the United States and other parts of the world take the PSAT. Uh, and 50,000 of the 1.5 million uh, make it to the commended or semifinal uh, recognition. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have 18. Uh, that's one of our highest numbers in school history. Uh, I believe our seven semifinalists ties our highest amount of semifinalists also uh, in school history. So we're very happy about that. And these 18 students uh, not only do well academically, but are very, very involved in the school athletics activities, they're leaders in clubs, uh, they're, they're, they're good people. 
Uh, so we're very, uh, very excited to have them and have them being recognized tonight at the board meeting. Um, Dr. Rushi, do you want to let them know what they receive? Except, you know, besides the recognition by the, by the United States of America, what else do they receive from Haverford? <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Dunley. I, I will. Uh, if the students were present with us this evening, we would be presenting them um, with a clock, with a plaque um, identifying School District of Haverford Township um, and your name on that. It's a, we will get them to you. It's a, it's a small token. Um, but we just you know, want you to know how very proud we are to have each one of you as representatives, first and foremost, of Haverford High School, but then also of the school district of Haverford Township and uh, our, commu our broader community as, as well. Uh, it's encouraging to know uh, that you will be going out into the world, making the decisions that will ultimately impact all of us. And it's nice to know that there are such good minds uh, that will be involved in, in that work as you mature and, and continue in, in your studies. So thank you for representing us so well. Mr. Dunnigy, back to you. I yeah. feel like I'm on a game show. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, run through each student. Uh, so if you're here, can you just uh, say hello so everyone knows who you are and, and you get recognized. Um, Megan Ari. Megan was also a National Merit semifinalist. Hello. Uh, Nadia Awad. Uh, we did have a few people tonight who do have other obligations. Uh, it's a busy group. Uh, Karen Buchanan. Hi. Uh, Vincent Del Archipretti. We'll just clap even if they're not here. Tyler E. Hi. Uh, David Graff, Ian Kratzinger. Ian also is a National Merit Semifinalist. Hello. Stephen Lozano. Hello. <laughs> this, is, this is worse than going to class, isn't it, guys? <laughs> uh, Jocelyn Miller. Uh, Benjamin Morse. Benj Benjamin was also a National Merit semifinalist. Hi. Uh, Daniel Richardson. Hello. <laughs> uh, Grace Schumacher. Elizabeth Swiker. Elizabeth also is National Merit semifinalist. Maura Timoney, James Zucata, Sarah Wax. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna embarrass Sarah real quick. Sarah got a uh, full ride scholarship yesterday, uh, Fulbright uh, scholarship yesterday. So we're very proud of that. And I'm sure uh, many others will get some Scholarship money. Congratulations, Sarah. Yay, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Emma Whitaker. She's awesome. Uh, National Merit Semifinalist. And last but not least, Abby Wiedemann. Abby, you might know the name because her mom's here today, too. So we're double zooming in the Wiedemann house tonight. So congratulations. So I just wanted to say again, thank you, uh, school board, for taking time out to recognize uh, these these fine students. And congratulations, everybody, uh, and have a good night. And and see me uh, for your clocks next week. And and a clock is uh, it's a very special thing. It's it's sort of like a trophy. I know you have clocks on your cell phones now, but when you see it, uh, you, I'll explain to you what a clock is. So <laughs> thank you, and uh, have a good night. Congratulations, one and all. You can put the clocks next to your typewriters. Yeah. yeah. Can I just take one minute, Larry, to say congratulations, to speak for all the administrators and the principals, to say that the academic awards are our favorite awards. And I know Ms. Christensen is here, and I'm here, and all the other principals, we congratulate you. Linwood has four kids. 
And I'm very, very, very proud of all the lines, but we're proud of all of you. You're all Fords now. So way to go. Congratulations. Great. Thanks, Susan. Okay, moving right along. Next, next item on our agenda is construction update. Ken Matthews. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, we just have a brief update this evening and uh, a, a few items, a few change orders. So I'll start with Linwood. Things uh, continue to progress well. Um, we are the exterior of the wall, the windows, metal panels, et cetera, are going in. Um, they are uh, on the inside of the building, the classroom wing is, gosh, uh, all the ceilings are mostly done, all kinds of things. Uh, so it's really moving along well. Um, no issues to speak of. COVID has had a minor effect here and there, um, but overall the project's in good shape. We continue to be on schedule. Um, and so other than that, we're in good shape. So. Um, then for tonight, we do have a handful of change orders, typical change orders. Uh, as always, we go through, we vet them. We deal with the architect, the engineer, go through, make sure they're appropriate. A lot of back and forth with the contractors. Uh, so there are a few. One of them is a COVID related, which we know we continue to have, have those as we progress. Um, so just wanted to see if there were any questions on them or progress as far as Linwood is concerned. Any questions or comments from the board? All yeah, right. can, can you just remind us what the current timeline is on Linwood? Sure. So contractually, uh, the original contractual completion date was February 1st. So if you take the six week delay uh, from COVID where work stopped and if, if it a day for day. So we're looking at mid-March right now. We're working with the contractors to uh, hopefully by the end of this month, really fine tune and get to a point where we agree to an actual date. Uh, and then there will be some costs as associated with that for the extension of time, but uh, we'll work through that in January. Uh, but it's, it's going to be on or around mid-March. We're pushing to get it done as, as soon as possible, but uh, we're hovering right around that network at this point. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, um, Ken, what is the supply chain looking like for COVID um, PPE? I know the spring we had those shortages and sure. um, what is it looking like now? Is it pretty easy to get that equipment? Uh, from a PPE standpoint, yeah, there's yeah. no uh, problems that I've heard of at all from that. It's really just overall supply chain. You know, for example, um, factories that have gotten COVID or rooftop ductwork, you can kind of see it up there behind me. You know, their, their plant that manufactured that, they, some, one or two of them got COVID, the plant shut down for two, two weeks. So, you know, luckily it wasn't a critical path item for us. So it came about three weeks later. So those type of little uh, bumps have been there. Um, cabinet installers were supposed to start on Monday. One of them had COVID, so they, they had to shuffle things around. So now they started today. So you're having those little things, but luckily for us, all of our major equipments here um, on site, the boilers, the rooftop units. So um, we're, we're fortunate from that standpoint. So we don't see any significant impact to the project. Okay. Um, any transmission on the job site so far? Uh, no, uh, not, knock on wood. We have not, no, we've had one gentleman that may have been exposed that showed up and they were immediately told they left, uh, but he ended up, he did not have it. So, um, but we are hearing more and more cases, just like, of course, you all, what you're going through across the board. So there definitely has been a spike. So hopefully uh, that doesn't impact the project. Well, thanks for keeping things rolling as much as possible in these times. Yes, uh, well, constantly reminding the, the workers, you know, mass, et cetera. Uh, so just like, um, any, anybody else, uh, you know, you have to watch over them, so to speak. So, um, well then as far as the high school, uh, things got rolling this week, site fencing got started. Um, they're 
the silt sock, the erosion and sedimentation control measures that have to go in that got started today. So it's going to really get moving here quickly where they'll start probably within a week, scrape or less, scraping off all the topsoil. They store it off to the side. They start building the lay down area for the trailers and those type of things and then start doing the underground work that has to be done. So um, we're really pushing that along. Things are moving well so far. Um, and we have, uh, I think, as we mentioned before, we, we do have four contractors that um, are experienced and are well known and are, are uh, respected and that we've, our project team has worked with in the past, which is good. Um, and then the only other thing for the high school this evening, as far as an update, uh, we did put, uh, we have to hire a testing and inspection agency, you know, to test all the concrete, the steel, the earthwork. Uh, so they record that, they, they monitor that as it goes in. So uh, an RFP was put out for those services, just like Linwood or any other project. We had four firms come back with proposals and uh, we have before you this evening uh, to proceed with David Blackmore Associates. They're the same firm that's doing the testing inspections for Linwood. Uh, so that's the only, only other item. Any other questions, comments from the board? All right, Ken, well, thank you very much. We'll look forward to your next visit. Thank you all, have a wonderful evening. Next item on our agenda is our independent auditor's report. Uh, welcome, Carl Hogan. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is that okay? Yes, sir. All right. So I'm going to try to be as uh, quick as possible just to give everybody an update. Um, prior to tonight, I did meet with the finance committee. And I met with the finance committee. We went over the year end results where the numbers were gonna fall. We've since the finance committee meeting have went ahead and uh, put together the full draft audit report. Um, the game plan is um, to allow the board uh, time to review the audit report, um, to digest it, um, and then to have any kind of questions before it's full approval on December 17th. So um, this is just kind of a first look at it this will give everybody the opportunity to review it. And then I guess at that point, um, they could go to Dr. Rushi or uh, Mr. Regal and talk to them about any kind of uh, comments or have any kind of questions they have. Um, and if they need to reach out to me, they can. So, or you can reach out right to me as well, um, whatever is uh, most comfortable for everybody. So I put up on the screen, um, the audit report. I'm going to kind of just go over briefly what I think are the most important parts of the audit report without taking up too much time here tonight. Um, but obviously, I'm going to first um, talk about the independent auditor's report. The independent auditor's report is on pages one and two, um, outlines uh, management's responsibilities, our responsibilities. On this page here, it kind of outlines what responsibility we're taking for the different sections of the audit report. But at the end of the day, obviously, the opinion paragraph right here, um, basically stating that the numbers that were presented to us by management were fairly presented for the year ended June 30th, 2020. Um, if everybody's not gonna read, obviously not all seven, you know, some of you may read all 68 pages of the report or 70 pages of the report. Um, I know everybody won't read all 70 pages, but I really encourage everybody to read pages three through 13 or 14. This is management's discussion and analysis. Um, you're already halfway through this current year. You're starting the budget for the next year. Um, this is kind of a historical perspective, but I think these pages are really important. Number one, because it gives you the opportunity to talk about uh, management, the opportunity to talk about 2019, 2020, where you ended up, um, but at the end, of, um, but it also gives them the opportunity to talk about the future and what kind of impact or financial impacts, what happened in 1920 and what's happened since um, the June 30th, 2020. That also being said, I think management did a really nice job this year. Um, basically with COVID, this was an unusual year and management was able to define COVID um, at the beginning of management's discussion analysis then to kind of explain how COVID impacted the finances during the year 
And at the end, during the uh, future factors, kind of wrap it up or bring it to a conclusion, how it's gonna, COVID's gonna impact the district in 2021 uh, and how things look. Um, I'm gonna kind of skip around here a little bit to go to what I think is the most important page. And this is a page that we went over in the finance committee. It's at the back of the audit report. Um, this is the budget to actual schedule. Um, it's in the back of the audit report just because we don't audit the budget numbers, but the budget may be one of the most important financial things that the board does on an annual basis. And I kind of look at this as like a the board kind of look at it. Hey, how did we do with our budget and how it came in actual? A lot of things usually happen during the year um, that you don't anticipate, but this is never more the case for 1920. Nobody could have anticipated. Um, what happened. Um, so up at the top, we have your total budget of revenues at $127.5 million. Um, they came in at $126 million. We talked about this during the finance committee. Haverford has historically, from what I've seen the past three years, been very conservative budgeting their revenues. And it was good that things were budgeted conservatively in 2019, 2020 because of the pandemic. Um, there was a decrease in the local source revenues. And this is kind of twofold, which management highlights in management's discussion and analysis. The first being um, investment income. Um, even though you're conservative, nobody could have ever anticipated um, interest rates went from where they were at the beginning of the year to almost zero. And also delinquent taxes um, was another big factor for being under budget because of the fact that the Tax Claim Bureau did not collect and remit any taxes from basically from April to June. So those are the two big factors there make up most of the $1.5 million under budget. But when you're looking at that from $127 million budget in revenue, and you take that as a percentage, that's really good given the circumstances. As you come down below the expenditures, we're gonna see some larger variances here. Um, once again, we discussed this um, all across the board within the diff different functions, we have some positive variances. Um, overall total expenditures were $5.8 million under a $128 million budget. Um, seems like a lot, um, but uh, once again, when you take it as a percentage and you take it in a perspective related to the pandemic, it's really not that bad. But when we actually dig deeper into the numbers for some of these, especially as it relates to regular and special programs, um, if you kind of think about it, it makes sense. There were some unfilled vacancies um, within positions that weren't filled when once the pandemic um, uh, hit. Also purchase services when it relates to contracted services, um, supplies, et cetera, were under budget. And then if you look down here, down below operation and maintenance, student transportation services, buildings closed, not transporting kids. Hence, you have lower than expected uh, expenditures in the budgeted line items. And then as we come down below, um, we're gonna look at this a little bit on a different sheet too. There's a trans unbudgeted transfer out of $1.2 million. And this is a function of in previous years, the school board has went ahead and they've went ahead and they've budgeted uh, committed fund balance for capital projects. So even though it's not budgeted, it was committed within your fund balance to transfer over to the capital projects fund. So in the case for 2019, 2020, um, budget or transfers were made from that committed fund balance over to the capital projects fund. Um, number one, the biggest piece was for the high school track and the other piece was the, for the Coopertown elementary modular project. So when we went through the budgeting process and the, uh, during the 2019, 2020 year, um, you budgeted to use about $750,000. Um, when you take into effect the revenues being under budget, um, the expenditures being under budget, and then the transfer out of the committed fund balance, your fund balance increased by $2.3 million. So at the beginning of the year, you had $15.3 million of fund balance. End of the year, we have $17.7 million. Um, any questions, concerns? Or All right. All right, now I'm gonna go back up a little bit higher just to go over some of the other funds and the balance sheet. So this is the general fund right here um, that we just went over. Um, 
this year and in particular in the previous year, we've really been spending a lot of time within the capital projects fund. You have the new, L new Linwood elementary project going on. Um, we're gonna be starting to hit the high school project. We have a lot of capital items um, gonna be hitting a lot of construction projects um, starting to hit. So you have your capital projects fund, local sources is your investment revenue on um, um, amounts that you're sitting there, primarily bond proceeds. Um, then you come down below $15 million in construction project, uh, mostly consisting of the Linwood Elementary. There's that transfer in, see the money that we just spoke about, the 1.2, transferring it over um, to pay for those, uh, the modulars and the track project. And during the current year, you issued some new debt and you also issued a debt refunding. And if you remember on that last page, we look, just looked at, it was almost a half a million dollars of savings that you did on the bond um, refunding. Um, the district should have a lot of opportunities. I didn't think there'd be any kind of bond refundings happening, but with the market conditions, um, the district should be able to, in the future, hopefully here, see some additional bond refunding opportunities. So the net change in the fund balance is a positive 22 million, and that's just a function of the bond proceeds coming in for the construction projects and the relative expending of, the, of that money related to it. So beginning of the year, you had about $6 million. Um, you added 22 million and now you have 28 million, primarily made up of all bond proceeds to be spent on upcoming capital projects. So we just talked about the ins and outs for the year. Now we're gonna talk about the balance sheet um, or of your governmental funds. Basically, this is a function of your current assets over your current liabilities. The excess over the two being your fund balance. As you can see, up above your total assets, um, primarily made up of cash and amounts due from governments, primarily subsidies from the state um, between when you recognize the expense and when you receive the reimbursement from the state. Um, we're about $34 million, obviously most of it cash. Um, total liabilities, $14 million at the end of the year, all made up primarily of accrued salaries and benefits. If you think about it, the teachers work from September through June, but they get paid through August. So you accrue their services to which they worked, and then you pay them out over the summer. So that's basically the teacher summer's pays, plus the um, last quarter or the second quarter through June for the teasers, which makes up a big piece of that liability as well. So when you take the excess of the assets over the liabilities, um, you have there's that $17 million that we were talking about. One of the things we talked about during the finance committee meeting um, was how do we get this unassigned amount um, to within the 8% that's allowed by PDE of the next year's expenditure budget. Um, we discussed the variances that were on the previous page and it was the um, consensus of the finance committee that since these are one-time savings related to um, the coronavirus and there's a lot of one-time expenditures coming up related to capital projects, um, they thought it was a prudent thing to do is to put the money into a capital projects commitment to help offset. And then hence the district won't have to go ahead and borrow monies um, related to, or could actually subsidize those plan projects, but also maybe fund projects that you might have had to go out and get debt for in the future. So um, that was the consensus and that's how it is in the draft audited financial statements now. Um, plus there was approximately about $850,000 that was used to balance the 2021 budget um, during the budget process. And then over here, we have your capital projects fund. Um, obviously there's projects going on at the end of the year, accounts payable, and then those amounts are committed at year end for capital projects. Any questions, concerns? No? All right. And then uh, one of the last, one of the few things I'm going to talk about is the, you have two other funds. You have a food service fund and you have an internal service fund. Um, the food service fund is in-house. And when coronavirus hit, um, the state of Pennsylvania um, required you or mandated you to continue to pay your employees without having any revenue come in. Hence, um, there was a loss, as you can see here, in the food service fund related to having to pay your employees without the revenue coming in. Um, the district has since, in 2021, um, made a commitment of uh, funds from the general fund to help subsidize the food service fund and get it through 
in 2020-21 um, due to even though you are in school, you're still not running at full um, full capacity, et cetera, and still anticipate a loss. Um, the internal service fund over here is your activity within the um, Delaware County Health uh, Health Delaware County Healthcare Consortium. Um, as you can see down below, um, you had an increase in your fund balance with the Delaware County Healthcare Consortium. Um, the Delaware County Health Healthcare Consortium requires you to maintain a certain amount of um, fund balance to, you know, as kind of a lag in case your experience gets uh, uh, turns in the opposite way. So you want to have about six months of claims they're aiming for. This is, might be a little bit more than six months of your claims, but that only makes sense. We talked about this um, during finance as well. If you think about it, people stop going to medical facilities from April to June. And I would anticipate when I see the upcoming years on um, healthcare consortium financial statements that all the districts across the board as people started uh, venturing out of the house, starting getting medical procedures, that this fund balance will go down back through the other way. So as you can see in the previous year, you had about $7 million in that position, which is about half of what your anticipated premiums were for the year. So this increase or uptick might just be a one year thing. And I would anticipate we might see a negative um, number here as people start venturing out. And you'll see that uh, in the 2021 budget, we didn't increase our line item for health care. And in 21, 22, we won't in increase our health care line item again to try to draw down on that. Uh, and, you know, it's a nice thing to have that, uh, that balance in that trust, but you can't transfer it over to the general fund if you needed it. It's, it's restricted to that trust for the healthcare. And so all we can do is keep our rates down from year to year until it gets down, the fund or the balance gets down to a manageable level. So it's a nice thing to have, but you can't just use it for anything. So that's correct. Um, so, but, you know, whatever's in your fund balance, they'll adjust your premiums annually to, you know, make sure that your fund balance doesn't accumulate too high, though, at the same time. Um, the, the healthcare consortium will, that is. And finally, I'm just going to go back to the audit report. Um, this is an important schedule too. schedule of findings and question costs. Obviously, the district has implemented and has the proper personnel within the business office to implement internal controls. Over the past three years, um, we've implemented some recommendations that um, don't rise to the level of getting put in the audit report, but only improving the operations within the business office. We continue to work with um, management and the board to implement those recommendations. But as it pertains to the audit report and uh, rising to the level of what we consider a significant deficiency or material weakness, um, we had none of those. And uh, that's a good thing for the district. So we touched base on the clean audit report, your fund balances and uh, no findings. Um, is there anybody else, or does anybody on finance want me to touch base on anything else we touched base on um, previously? I mean, I know it's a lot, I could talk forever, but I know I'm, yeah, I probably have met my limit for people. Not seeing any, anybody with their hand up. It's exciting stuff. Uh, if, you're Bridget, if you're an accountant. Bridget, go ahead. Um, no, I think uh, you did a really good job of, of reviewing the audit report, um, which now we see in full. The finance uh, liaisons just uh, saw some of the selected schedules to discuss, and I think the conversation went well. I think another um, thing to highlight is that, um, you know, it obviously the end of last school year, fiscal year was challenging in many ways. Um, when I kind of look at the report, I um, do a spread and I compare one fiscal year to the previous one and the one before that, just to see if there's any trends or outliers. And um, you, uh, Carl did a nice job, you know, walking through um, some of the reasons why revenues and expenses changed. Um, I think it's also important to just highlight that it was, there weren't significant like financial shifts or changes, right? Like the, um, the district maintained 
um, the proportion of our budget that goes to instruction and to support services. Um, if anything, there was a shift because, not because of COVID related adjustments in spending, but um, because of the, you know, being able to take advantage of the uh, debt service savings and restructuring there. Um, and so I think the, you know, sometimes you look at a 70 page report and there's a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of numbers, a lot of detail. Um, but when you look at a district like ours that has growing enrollment, um, I think it's important to be able to relate the financials to kind of the, the student experience and the experience we have in our school. And that's the continued commitment um, to support the instructional program and, and the staff needed for, um, for the students in our schools, uh, the commitment to quality school buildings, um, and also that uh, fiscal balance with um, trying to find uh, the best um, financing available and being careful stewards of the surplus that we have so that it affords us the opportunity to continue to um, consider the capital improvements and the program improvements. Um, and, you know, I just, I like to kind of underline that aspect to it too. It's, it's not all numbers for the sake of numbers, but um, for the, you know, the very important work that the district does. And I think, um, you know, that's something that's, that's hard to glean from an audit, <laughs> an audit report, but um, it gives me comfort to, to look in and see the, you know, the steady um, commitment to uh, the quality education program and the careful management of our resources. Other questions or comments from, from the board? And Carl, early on, you, you mentioned that you didn't think that uh, the board would necessarily read all 68 pages, but I, if I were a betting man, uh, I bet that Bridget's going to read all 68 pages. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple notes on some wording and some comments that I'll send um, after the meeting. <laughs> we, we, we place great value on that, Bridget, so thank you for that. A any other questions for Carl? Are we... Are we, uh, we'll see this uh, back on the agenda <clears throat> on the 17th for board approval? On the 17th, Mr. Feinberg, correct. Okay. All right, well, thank you, sir. Yep. Thanks, Carl. Yep, thank you. Next item on our agenda is high school course selection guide. We have Ms. Saxa and uh, Mr. Donnie. Thank you very much, Mr. Feinberg. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Rushi, administrators, and of course, members of the public. Mr. Donaghy and I are pleased to bring to you this evening the 2021-2022 course selection guide update. You can go to the next slide there, Rob. Uh, so we bring this guide before the board uh, and the public each December. In, in the prior year the, uh, to the development of this guide, we typically are engaged in a curriculum review cycle. This audit of our programs allows us to determine what, if any, changes will be made to our course offerings. Uh, you may recall that we've recently added some social studies elective courses. Uh, we also shifted the approach to many of our science courses in the year prior to that. And so while we typically develop or update our courses in the fall, this year we have paused that curriculum review cycle uh, just so that we could adjust for our hybrid and our virtual instructional models. Uh, so therefore we are not proposing any major additions or deletions in this particular course selection guide. Instead, we'll present just a few updates and a few minor alterations. Uh, then at our next board meeting on December 17th, we will ask for the board's approval of this guide. And once that approval is granted, then we will publish the guide and our students and our families can use it for their course selection process, which will occur usually in January or maybe at the very start of February, depending on our schedules. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Dunnegy to go into the details a little bit about what the updates are to the guide this year. Amen. Thank you, Jen. Uh, we don't have a lot of changes. And with me tonight is Mr. Bardoni too. He, he has a big hand in uh, putting the guide together with the other administrators and the teachers and all. It's the guide, I, I, it's definitely longer than the, the uh, counting uh, 
thing that you just witnessed. Uh, so there's so much in it that we didn't really have to make a lot of changes this year. And with the pandemic, uh, our teachers have done a wonderful job of changing their curriculum and making it better. You know, just uh, it's one of the, the great side effects of the, the entire pandemic is we've looked at every aspect of our curriculum and make sure that it's solid, make sure that uh, it's equitable, make sure that uh, it balances technology and in-person learning. So it's in that aspect, in a weird way, it's been uh, very fruitful in uh, making our, our courses better. So we didn't have to change a whole lot uh, at all. We do have uh, things, you know, that, that we, we always talk about uh, behind the scenes of, of what's next and what's cutting edge and what we can, uh, what we can bring to you. But that'll, that we're about a year away from uh, a couple new courses. And then we've added close to, I think, uh, 12 to 15 courses in the last four years. So we're getting our numbers up in all those courses. Uh, they're running very well. Um, they're exciting, they're popular, and they, they uh, balance the standards with uh, student interests. So it, it, it's working out well. So a couple of the changes you can see on the slide is we're just going to, uh, our alternative day classes are for students in uh, special education band course. Uh, at the end of the day, they need alternative day courses to balance out their their band or course or other things. So one of the things we're adding is uh, an alternative day fitness and weight training, which is like a life, uh, a life, lo lifelong learning uh, fitness and weight training course, uh, very popular, obviously, in today's society. So we just wanted to expand that. There's interest there. We're renaming uh, applied engineering to engineering design. That's an upperclassman course. Uh, just changing the name to make it more applicable to what they're doing. Um, and then what we had to add this year was the graduation pathways. So we started that in, in the summer where we needed, uh, the state of Pennsylvania has graduation pathways of how you can graduate from a Pennsylvania school. Um, and you can, we'll do, we'll go to the next slide. We can go to the next slide now, Anna, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So you can see the different pathways. They all relate to the Keystone exam. And, uh, back in the summer, it was, uh, the pathways were for the class, this year's graduating class. Uh, and that changed last week, uh, where now they're for the class of 2023. So, one of the changes the state made based on the, uh, the pandemic was to push it back to the class of 2023, our present uh, sophomores. Um, so these are the pathways that they have to graduate. Now, most of it relates to our Keystone exams and our students do very well on our Keystone exams. Um, so we, we believe that every uh, student in, you know, who attends Hereford High School can, can get through one of these five pathways. Um, some of the other aspects of certifications, uh, Votech certifications, uh, ASVAB testing, which uh, used to be a military test. Now it's a test. Uh, it's, it's kind of a survey type, type test that we can have students take and, and get a passing score. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways we can have the students uh, graduate with uh, in the state of Pennsylvania's eyes. So we're not overly concerned um, but we did have to add this to our course selection guide uh, to make sure that it's, it's readily evident for, for anyone reading the guide. Uh, and then I just want to, uh, you know, thank the teachers because they do such a wonderful job each day with the coursework, with improving the coursework and bringing us new ideas and fresh ideas that, that, are, that usually come from the students. The students uh, bring an idea to the teachers or the administrators, and uh, we uh, do our research and our homework and talk to our, our neighboring schools uh, to stay current and to stay, stay competitive. I don't know if Jen or John, you have anything else you wanna add that I missed? 
No, Pete, um, I think that you covered the piece with the, um, the graduation pathways. We had intended to present that to you as something that was going to occur uh, beginning this year, and uh, it will not. However, we do want to make sure that students are aware uh, that they have multiple ways to meet these uh, graduation requirements. It is not only the Keystone exam anymore, which we, we find uh, a measure of relief for a lot of students. So we're, we uh, will continue to work with counselors and administrators to ensure that students and families really understand what their pathway to graduation can be. Uh, and then I just want to, you can go ahead. Oh, also just uh, uh, another update that came out at the same time as the um, postponement of the pathways is that um, uh, they had, as you know, last school year, students who took a Keystone exam did not uh, course, a triggering course, which would have been either algebra one, biology or literature in 10th grade. Uh, they did not have the Keystone exams in the spring and therefore they did not have to take them. However, we were told that they would be expected to take them this year uh, or it needed to be advised to take them this year. And uh, that requirement has been suspended. Those students who took that course last year are not required to pass a Keystone as part of a graduation. So they will not need to do that. That is a change. So we wanted to make sure that everybody heard about that. And then we can just pop over to the last slide. And just to echo what Mr. Donaghy said, um, you know, as with all of our endeavors, this guide is a result of much collaboration and teamwork. Um, we thank our teachers for their continuous thoughtful reflection and development of these courses. As Mr. Donaghy mentioned, we thank our students for their input into what the courses uh, are that they would like to see and how we would like them to occur for them. I thank, you know, of course, our curriculum coordinators and the high school administrators for their guidance throughout the process. Process. Uh, I also want to just give a quick shout out to uh, Mr. Baradoni, who uh, he is our high school assistant principal who coordinates uh, the updates to the guide and makes sure that it's ready for our families and our students to use throughout their high school careers. Well, thanks everybody for, for your work on this. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Okay, so we're gonna bring this back for approval at the next meeting, correct? That's correct. We will ask for your approval then. And just one note, I want to make sure I, I say this correctly. The exam is does not need to be passed for those students who took those courses last year. They do need to have passed the course. So just to make sure that that's uh, clear. Sorry, I didn't include that at first. Thanks. Tim. Just going to add that is a relief. I know as the um, school year was starting out and being on conversations with board members from districts all across the state. Um, people were planning into uh, their school year um, to add on a, you know, a couple weeks or months of review of biology and anticipation of the students having to take the exam from the, you know, the prior year or shifting their curriculum around. And um, you know, the, I think the burden and the stress of taking those tests for subjects that aren't fresh to students anymore. Um, I, I appreciate that the, um, the state has lifted the requirement that that those students need to go back and, and take a test from the prior year. Thanks, Bridget. Any other questions or comments from the board? All righty, thank you. Next item on the agenda is first reading of policy number 104 and number 104 AR, equal opportunity and non-discrimination in employment and contract practices. Mr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Feinberg, uh, members of the board. Uh, uh, so continuing with our efforts to uh, update our anti-discrimination policies as a result of the adoption of new Title IX regulations uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, we are presenting tonight uh, only uh, policy 104 uh, and the ARs attached to that policy. Uh, we do have a number of other policies that will reflect some of those changes in regulations, but uh, uh, we wanted to pause and make sure we have that uh, in the proper form to bring to you. So tonight should be relatively brief um, in that um, we we did see a policy um, and, and you adopted policy 103, uh, non-discrimination with respect to students. This is a briefer policy, 104 equal opportunity, non-discrimination uh, with respect to uh, staff uh, and employees. Uh, the, this document that you have in front of you uh, 
uh, reflects the initial work of the policy liaisons uh, on the first draft of 104 uh, with input from the district solicitor's office. And, and I'll mention in particular Ed Diazio because he does a great job and, uh, and is very responsive um, in our new format where we, uh, um, we drug some, some folks into the modern era uh, or I should say the policy liaisons drug me into the modern era. And we now operate on Google Docs, which really is, is a great idea. It works much better. Um, so we, um, uh, with Ed's comments um, and responses to the comments from the policy liaisons, we have made certain changes. They are not all yet reflected in this document. And those on the policy liaison group will see that that's the case. We, we show uh, some of the some of the suggestions that um, were made and discussed, and they haven't yet been finalized. Um, uh, and others, we were just waiting for a final determination from the solicitor's office before we actually made those changes. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. But uh, you will recall again that uh, 103 was to protect students uh, from various forms of uh, uh, discrimination. Uh, and this policy 104 is, is meant to cover employees. It's fairly straightforward, uh, this policy compared to 103, I would say. Um, we are looking at some details such as, you'll see the phrase uh, in the third paragraph under guidelines on page one of policy 104, you'll see the phrase and third parties. Uh, and it's been suggested and we've discussed that, you know, we were not, certain that we want to expand the scope of the coverage of this policy that far. Uh, and um, uh, the solicitor's office has indicated that they're probably okay with us removing that language. So that when you see this in a second read, it, it will probably be without that, that phrase, uh, uh, third policy, uh, third parties. Um, and you'll also see in the first paragraph of that, that section, uh, that we are trying to remove language that we think is outdated and unnecessary. Uh, and as long as, um, and we've really already received a response saying that uh, we can do that. So you'll, that language will be eliminated. The, the word handicap will be eliminated when you see this a second time around. And that came from, uh, from a member of the liaison group. Um, and we discussed that at our first meeting. Uh, there are other changes in uh, from the I should say the draft policy uh, that was uh, initially brought forward that are already in this, uh, this draft. Uh, the liaisons will know what changes they are, but since, since this board is seeing this for the first time, some of those changes aren't designated. Um, uh, what you will see is that the original policy is essentially being replaced wholesale, and that's the deletions in line outs uh, and in red in the second part of this document. Uh, obviously, I invite the members of the liaison group to uh, add anything uh, to a description of 104 uh, and or any questions, comments from the board, which we would then uh, look at, perhaps uh, discuss amongst ourselves um, uh, on Google Docs and uh, take any of those questions that have legal implications to Solicitor's Office to bring this back to you for a second read at our next at our next meeting. Any questions or comments from the board at this time? Okay. Not seeing any. Okay, so I'm going to for the liaison group particularly. I'm going to go ahead and make the changes that I believe we've we've discussed and that uh, the solicitor's office has agreed to. And then if there are any further comments. Uh, you can raise them in that uh, format and we'll, I'll incorporate those and bring them back to the full board for a second read at our next meeting. Of course, we also have the AR document that is in front of the board tonight, also for a first read. Um, these are brand new ARs. We didn't have ARs before. The guidelines were uh, originally in the original policy. Um, I, I have already um, adjusted some language uh, in the ARs that I will uh, uh, incorporate into the Google Doc and seek uh, the input from the um, liaisons. It's not substantive uh, language. It's uh, just some clarification. 
So you'll let me know if you think it it achieves that, clarifies, or, or does the opposite uh, when you see what I suggest. Uh, and uh, if it does clarify and you agree, we'll incorporate that into uh, uh, the document for the second read with the board. Again, we've made some, uh, the, the liaison group has made some changes to the initial draft. Um, for instance, just as an example on the, on the second page, uh, we've aligned the, um, the time frames to match the 20 day uh, time frames um, for, for appeals um, uh, to be consistent with what we did last, last time with the uh, 103 document. Again, any, any input from the liaisons? If, um, if so, please, please jump in. Or well, Greg, just to, comments. sorry, um, Greg, just to clarify for the public, ARs are administrative regulations and I'm they, sorry. Yeah, they're kind of like they outline how we can put the policy or how um, the school district can put the policies into practice. I think if I'm correct. Thank you. Thank you for that. Correct. Any other yeah, comments I, or questions? Go ahead. Internet. Sorry. Yeah. And I would just add that, um, you know, some of the um, some of the revisions to to this policy and it, and and you're right, Greg. It is it is mostly just you know re, uh, rewrite of the entire thing, but it is also um, connected to the other policies that we've been um, going over and to the board pol board policy um, 103 that we um, that we approved at a previous board meeting. So you'll see um, a lot of similarities between um, that policy and this policy. Um, for example, a reference to the Title IX coordinator, um, which is something that is new uh, because of the, uh, the regulations that came down from the federal government. So, um, and just to remind everyone th that that was the impetus for um, really making these revisions to these policies was that we, um, or every, every school district in the country was um, basically um, given a mandate to, to change their policies to be in line with the new federal regulations. So um, that's just a little background and I'm previewing my board liaison report now. <laughs> Very good, well, thank you. And I'll just add to that, that uh, uh, you'll, the board will continue to see a number of policies in the near future that are in the same vein. We're, we're continuing to adjust and, and, and uh, dovetail various policies that touch upon uh, uh, discrimination, harassment, bullying, and the like. So we will be bringing a number of policies to you uh, that will continue to reflect uh, adherence to the new Title IX regulations. And at the same time, taking the opportunity just to update parts of our policies that need update, uh, you know, aside from uh, the requirements of the new Title IX regulations, right? But thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, thank you, Mr. Parker, and thank you to the policy liaisons. And we'll segue right into the uh, board liaison report, Antoinette. Yeah, so I'll just continue where I left off. Um, so exactly like uh, Mr. Parker was saying, um, there are a series of policies that the policy liaisons are looking at right now that all have to do with similar subjects. Um, so the uh, policy liaisons met on November 23rd, um, in addition to 104 um, that we just went over um, we also discussed policies uh, 247 and 248, which are um, on anti-hazing and um, anti-harassment. Um, so we have made a couple of uh, similar type changes to what um, we presented or um, Mr. Parker presented tonight um, to 104. Um, not, we're looking at these policies for not just um, do they make the proper changes, um, under the regulation, but also do they conform to our districts and our district's um, goals and policies. So looking at everything at, at the wording of those policies and um, making some, some changes uh, based on, um, on the federal regulation language, but also based on um, you know, our, our district itself as well. Um, so uh, I believe we're going to continue on um, the 247 and 248, which uh, we've been discussing, but um, they 
are similar. And so the policy liaisons wanted to make sure that we were able to discuss 247, 248, and also 249, which is on anti-bullying, um, and present those to the board altogether, since they, um, they might have common themes in them. And we don't want to have to revise one of those that are interrelated, because we realized that, that we should make it a change uh, as we were going through one of the other ones. So that's also a preview of policies to come. So yeah. you're welcome, everyone. <laughs> Can I just add on to what you um, just said? So also related to the policy work, um, as we ramp up reviewing these policies and um, you know, looking at different drafts and revisions, um, just in case the public is curious, these are publicly posted on our website. Um, so if anyone's curious, um, you can go to the school district's website, go to the school board um, drop down, go down to board policies, and then you can actually access and reference some of these policies that we're talking about. And as the, the new policies are, as they're revised and then approved by the board, they'll be posted to this website. So they, they are available for public viewing. Yeah, and that, that's a great point, Kristen, and also public comment as well. Um, so the not only do, do these get reviewed by the, the policy liaisons, but they also get read by the board twice before we vote. So, um, you know, if anyone has has public comments as well, they can always submit those um, either, you know, in an email to the board or in public comment. So um, like I said, the, the, the policies that we're looking at right now are 247, 248 and 249. Thanks for adding that. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Antoinette. We'll look forward to the next episode of Exciting Policies. But really, thanks, thanks for the work that you're doing. Now in our continuing saga of uh, nine months into COVID-19, just when you thought maybe it was safe to go back in the water, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, I believe, uh, uh, PDE and the State Department of Health uh, hit us with something new and uh, Dr. Rushi and her comments will touch on that and where we are and where we think we're going. Dr. Rushi. Thanks, Mr. Feinberg. Um, actually, I've organized the comments onto a few slides this evening because there, there's quite a bit that's happening um, and un some of it unique to Delaware County. So there are five components to what I'm going to, sh to share tonight, and I'm going to do my best to be really clear about which ones are coming from the Pennsylvania Department of Health and PDE for all schools and which are coming through the Pennsylvania Department of Health unique to Delaware County. So if we're looking at those five components that we're going, can we go to that next slide? Thanks. All right, so what I'm hoping to accomplish tonight is to overview that recent PDE, PDE publication. And I'm going to go back to my disclaimer that I, that I was using many times when we would meet during the summer. This reflects 8.51 in the evening on December 3rd. Subject to change as early as tomorrow morning if something else comes, comes out from PDE. Uh, but there, uh, there are updated guidelines or guidance from the Department of Education and the Department of Health uh, referring to how we respond to COVID-19 cases in the schools. I will explain that tonight. And if there are questions, I'll answer as many as I can. We have been told that further clarity from PDE in the form of a frequently asked question document is, ex is expected. Um, so there are questions that we, when I say we, my colleagues um, in district, out of district, questions that, that we have and are, are hoping to have answered by that. Uh, what we anticipate the implications of the new, you know, responding to COVID-19 um, enhanced mitigation is going to mean for us. The first is pretty easy. The first was an updated order requiring universal face covering. And actually we could have gotten a little graphic of a check mark there and put it right next to that. I, th I think we're going to be good, uh, you know, with everything that relates to the universal face coverings. The requirements for us of what we have to do following the identification of positive COVID cases in schools is new 
and that's what we'll talk a little bit at, at length about um, tonight. Then the third topic that we're going to, uh, to discuss on November 18th, Delaware County Council requested, made a request of Governor Wolf and it was a request for an enactment of additional mitigation strategies just for Delaware County. In response to that, the secretary, the, the Pennsylvania Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Levine, um, ordered additional mitigation efforts. One of those states that events or gatherings of more than 10 people indoors is prohibited. And this is until at least January 2nd. The document goes on to read that it, and it clearly specifies that does not apply to classrooms. But it also specifies it does apply to activities and to school sports. So uh, briefly this evening, Mr. Dunaghy is going to talk about you know, how we and the other schools in county and within the Central League are currently um, approaching that. The fourth thing I want to go over with you tonight is to let you know what we've been doing since the last time that we met and trying to address some of the staffing um, concerns that we shared with you last time uh, about you know, filling absences when folks have to be out. And then finally, to clarify the two recommendations that are on um, the board agenda this evening. So moving along and looking at that, responding to um, you know, cases of COVID in schools, the uh, Department of Health and Department of Education are uh, enacting what they're calling a rolling 14-day case count. Um, there's so a need to track cases daily by school, which we've been doing. I mean, we've got we've got a, a tracking of that, um, but exactly how the 14 days you know will work is has yet to be determined. Um, you know, for example, for some schools, day one was Monday. Um, my question is, day one for us, if we return students next week, does that become our day one? And is it the 14 days? And then we start another 14 day cycle um, after that. Uh, that is, that's the understanding. Um, if we start on, if we bring students back on December 9th and we don't have any cases reported that day, maybe we don't have any reported December 10th and maybe December 11th is the first day that we have something reported. Then my understanding is December 11th becomes day one for us. And then we're counting for a 14 day period. And when, when I finish here and we get to the next slide, you'll see why the 14 days starts, you know, starts to matter. Uh, ultimately, based on the number of cases and the size of a school, one of the recommendations can be to close school for a period of time. A concern that, that my colleagues both in district and across the county have is this is very likely to give very little notice to families. There is, you know, is the potential that, it, you know, based on these counts, we now need to close for, you know, for a, for a period of time. The important thing here for us, for all of us to be mindful of in, in the district is if the investigation of a case or the contact tracing that is necessary, the cleaning and the disinfecting can be accomplished in a faster time frame then the length of that closing may be, may be shortened. Right. So specifically, what are we talking about with that closing? Right. Everything is based on the size of the school. Our five elementary schools would fall into the category of being identified as medium-sized schools. You, you look at the full enrollment, you are not allowed to say, well, we're in hybrid, we only have half of the students in the, in the building. Right. Um, so that was one of the questions that we did ask and, and received an answer to right away. So all five of our elementary schools would be categorized as medium and our both of our secondary schools would be categorized as large schools. So if we move right on to that second column that is there, if there are between four and six cases within a 14 day period of time, right now we have been told the, those cases are identified as those who were contagious at a point in time when they were in the, in the building. Uh, we're waiting to get some of that in writing 
Uh, but that is what was reported from from um, a meeting with people at the at the department. But it has not appeared in in writing yet. So when there are anywhere from four to six cases, we could be looking at the potential of a closing from anywhere from three to seven days. What would make the difference for that? The difference would be, do we have all of the our contact tracing? Is the Chester County Department of Health able to do all of the case investigation that is necessary? I feel very confident that I'm going to be able to report the level of cleaning that we do on a regular basis. You know, we don't wait and do a whole lot of cleaning all at once. We, our staff are doing um, intense cleaning at the end of each day and in through each evening. Um, so I'm hopeful that the level of cleaning that we are going to do that we have been doing would be satisfactory um, unless there's something new or a different way, um, you know, that, that they want us to, to approach that, then certainly we'll, you know, abide by that and learn about any new ways that we can clean, clean the building. Um, but we will be looking to do whatever we can to, you know, follow those guidelines, make sure that the school is healthy and safe, and then get it back open as soon as, soon as possible. In that medium-sized school, if we went above seven cases, then we could lo be looking at the potential of a 14-day um, period of, of closure. Uh, moving down along the line, the, our secondary schools, as I said, they would be, um, be constituted as large schools. So they can have a few more cases um, before we would be looking at, um, the, you know, at these potential closures. I think it's important to note that these uh, the closures are part of the mitigation strategy because our county is in substantial um, on that matrix. It, we are not in and substantial community spread. It is not low. It is not in the moderate level. Delaware County is in this in the substantial area. So because it's substantial, and that's the only one that we put on the screen for tonight, we will provide a link for the full document and people will be able to see what the mitigation strategies and recommended closings are if we, when we eventually start to get back to moderate and then low uh, for, um, commu for community spread. <clears throat> so they're the two pieces out of the, out of the Department of Ed uh, and the Department of Health that impact every school district across Pennsylvania. So no, nothing is different for any other any other district um, than what I shared shared with you, unless they are in moderate or low community spread. Moving on now, what is unique to Delaware County, and that's where I had said County Council at back at their November 18th meeting made a request of the governor of the governor's office um, that they look at enacting additional mitigation strategies for, for our county. And that impacts indoor gatherings, as I mentioned, to 10 people. That impacts athletics, it impacts club activities. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Mr. Dunnegy if he'll talk a little bit just to give you some insight into what we're doing there because we all know that it is important and believe that it is important to, in a safe and healthy way, keep our students as, as involved as we can, again, being very mindful of their safety and, and, their, and their health, but their mental health all as well. So, Mr. Donaghy. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Rushi. Uh, and like uh, Katie said earlier, the, the students are doing a great job of figuring out creative ways to do their events either in person or um, on Zoom. Uh, and I'll give you a quick example. We're trying to figure out how to do the candy cane drive this year for charity. Okay. So Mr. B was on a, a conference call with a student and the teacher today for a half hour. So everything takes a little more time, but, but it's definitely worth it. So, um, in the sports world, I had a meeting this week with the central league principals and athletic directors, uh, the 10 person, uh, limit just so everybody knows is, uh, 10 people, including, including coach or coaches. So anything indoors 
uh, you're only allowed 10 people. So our, our Miss Robson, our athletic director and the coaches are working uh, and they've come up with a lot of great solutions as to how to get 10 people potted. So what we're going to do to start off is that we had to break the, the different teams into uh, who are indoors into pods and the indoor teams are wrestling, boys and girls, basketball and cheerleading. Okay. Uh, one of the most difficult ones to figure out is cheerleading, uh, believe it or not, because uh, they, they do everything together. So it's hard to break them and break them down and do fundamental work. So our teams are going to start out, you know, uh, we can't play any games or even think of playing any games till after January 2nd. And that means scrimmages, games, any type of competitions. Um, other schools, uh, the, the league is getting creative too. So when or if the ban is lifted, schools that can participate will participate if you know if they feel comfortable and they're ready to participate if you're not ready to participate whenever uh your district decides you participate then you you'll just jump right in so it's going to be a fluid type schedule which will be a little bit different than in past so we might have to play marple newtown four times this year instead of you know, I'm playing every team twice. So it really, uh, so they're trying to figure that out and that's in January. So between now and January, we have to, uh, for any indoor sports have to be under the 10 person limit and then not intersect with any of the other teams, uh, too. So that's part of the planning. All the normal protocols are still in place, you know, masking and all that normal, normal screenings that all stays in place. Um, there's no fans. Uh, we're not sure, you know, when we'll get to fans. We're going to continue our live streaming, uh, when the games start. And again, that's down the road. Uh, our primary, primary goal is just to get started in a safe, slow manner. So the 10 person actually helps us. Uh, if we didn't have the 10 person rule, we'd have all 25 students together, you know, on the girls basketball team or all 30 cheerleaders together. So this kind of, again, in a weird way is a, is a good, nice, slow start to the season. And then we're hoping, you know, things turn around a little bit so that we can get into the competitions. And then it gives the, the athletic directors, the principals and uh, you know, the players time too to adjust to whatever the competition rules are going to be in practice right now, we're, we're, you know, uh, we're going to be masked, um, for most sports, most of the time. Um, and then our, we have outdoor, our indoor tracks going outdoors, you know, as long as the weather holds up. So we're taking our precautions, but we're also being creative and trying to figure out ways to do this safely. Um, and the 10 person, uh, pods you, inherently pod you so it, it kind of helps us a little bit to get started and then see whatever the next uh the next mandate is i know that's a real quick overview thanks pete um the fourth topic that i wanted to um sort of highlight for you this evening is to let you know what we've been looking at in terms of, of how we're trying to address some of our staffing needs and and first and foremost um, we may get a little help in that you know, the CDC released new guidelines on quarantine length, that there's a possibility that it may be shortened from uh, anywhere from seven to 10 days. So we are awaiting our communication because recall the Chester County Health Department is our authority. So we are awaiting um, to see what their uh, direction will be from them. But that like we can't underestimate how helpful that change will be um, you know, provided that it still creates a safe environment. Um, but if it's determined by the health professionals and authorities that that's still, that that is a safe environment, it definitely will be a, 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 an assistance to us with our staffing. Uh, with our bus drivers, we have a low, we do have low numbers of students. Um, so we've heard, you know, some are not riding the buses and George has already been able to start condensing um, some of those runs and do so without extending the length you know, of, the, of the run. 
Um, so again, we'll say to parents, you know, if you've transported your child before and, and, you know, as we got into the school year, sort of thought, oh, it's okay, let the child, you know, I'm going to let my child take the bus. If you could go back to transporting them again, um, that's, that's a big help to us um, in condensing those units. Uh, because the bus driver staffing, the greatest challenge to that is, is the requirement of the, you know, the license. And you know, not something that you can just go out and pick up in a, in a week or so. Um, so, but we do feel that looking at um, shorter or less populated uh, buses um, that we can begin to do some of the condensing there. Uh, we spoke about the DCIU guest teacher program when we sent our communication out uh, right after, uh, just before the Thanksgiving break. Um, and we're continuing to publicize that, uh, let people know that if they want to become involved um, and that's gonna help us in, in the long term. Um, there is also a program at DCIU and we're going to do our best to make sure everyone is aware of it that you know, retirees can return you know, to the classroom. Uh, there's through the program at, at the IU, they would actually be working for the IU uh, and able to, able to do that. Um, so you hear a lot on the you know, evening news about doctors and nurses coming out of retirement um, just to help with the, you know, with the COVID situation in, in hospitals. There's just as much of a need uh, if there's any teacher who would be willing to um, you know, help us out during this period of time, but they thought they couldn't because they have already retired. Uh, you know, we'll set them up through the Delaware County Intermediate Unit to do that. Um, we have not thus far, you know, made use of our, we've sort of used it as a last resort, large group areas like an auditorium, um, and, and probably because it's not ideal. It's not, you know, it's not ideal to take two classes, even if those two classes are, you know, 10 children in one class and 12 in another, uh, and have them socially distanced in an auditorium with one, you know, one teacher there. That's a long day. There's a lot for that, you know, for that person to do. But as I said, it's a last resort. We have not utilized it. We can begin to, you know, take a look at what we're doing there. Um, for Haverford Online, if there's a short-term absence, meaning, meaning that a teacher has to be out for one day or two days, we're not talking now about someone who would be on quarantine. Um, we're going to ask those teachers to have asynchronous assignments available uh, so that we can utilize the substitutes for, the, for in the building uh, when, you know, when students are present. That does not mean that we're prioritizing in the building over Haverford Online. I wanna be very clear. This is, if I'm a Haverford Online teacher and I need to be out for one day or maybe two days, if I am a Haverford Online teacher and I need to quarantine and, and unfortunately become ill and I'm not able to continue with my instruction online, uh, then we will get a, sub, you know, a substitute. We're not going to have the children engaging in um, a completely asynchronous learning for, for 14 days. Uh, and we may find ourselves in a position where we are notifying families uh, that, you know, because of staffing, this is different from what I talked about at the, at the beginning of my remarks, but we may end up where we're notifying families with very short notice uh, to say that, you know, a teacher has to be out. We do not have a substitute uh, for the teacher and those children in that particular class, you know, would, may need to return to virtual learning. They're not quarantining, they're returning to virtual learning because it's a, st a, um, a staffing issue. So there are a few of the things that we have started to do. You'll see we've got a, a couple, I think maybe two substitutes on the agenda for approval tonight. So that, you know, every, every little bit helps. Uh, we've got some, even some instructional assistance um, on the agenda for, you know, for approval tonight. So, you know, we continue to try to get the message out there um, and are glad that even you know, during a holiday time, we've been able to keep moving there. And the, finally, the fifth um, component to my remarks this evening is to clarify, um, there are two items that are on the agenda. One is amending the health and safety plan. And the, the purpose of that amendment is to allow for timely response to COVID-19 cases if necessary. So to allow, if we needed to, um, you know, we uh, work with the Chester County Health Department and it's a three day closure or a two day or just one, you know, a one day closure. Even if we were to call a special meeting, um, it requires 24 hours of notice. Uh, I know that 
as dedicated board members, you'll meet any time. That's not, that's not the, the concern that I have. Um, I know that if I said to you, we need to meet about something, got you the information that you would make the time in your schedule to be there. My concern is the notification to families that we would have to wait a full 24 hours before you, you were able to, able to meet. So I'm you know, looking at it in terms of you know, when we have situations where it's either based on staffing needs or you know, based on the number of cases, to be able to efficiently and effectively respond to some of these changes that have come from the Department of Health and Pennsylvania Department of Education, and just be, you know, being mindful of the timeliness with which we would be able to inform our, our families. Um, I know the agenda item mentions district, school. Uh, you know, hopefully you've worked with me long enough to know that I'm, I, I don't know that I would want to close the whole district uh, for a 14 period day period of time without coming to you and saying that, you know, this is what we're looking at. That's different unless someone is coming in and saying that we have to. Uh, but to be able to respond to, to cases and the second recommendation that is on there, you know, as noted, uh, on our 1123 agenda, um, we uh, publicized there that we would be uh, bringing some kind of recommendation this evening um, that we would return to our hybrid model um, as of de as of December 9th. So I just wanted to clarify those two um, and give you a little bit of background as to why they're why they're on there. Thank you. Questions, comments from the board? Now I will say, uh, Dr. Rishi, you had mentioned uh, that uh, Delaware County's in the substantial category statewide. At this point, it's my understanding that 66 of the 67 counties in the state uh, are now in the substantial category. So it's a, uh, you know, the, this- uh, Not unique to us. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bridget. Thank you. Um, my question is, I know that the students and uh, are in virtual education now, and there's some questions still about when the 14 days would start. Do we have information now about the number of COVID cases that we would be reporting this week and how those um, how those relate to um, those state numbers that would kind of out of the gate put us in a situation of needing to um, return to virtual, um, you know, based on the size of the school and the number of cases. Uh, we, yes, we do have have information. I, I won't go into a lot of the detail ar around it because we've not finalized everything, but there's been a lot of activity at the high school this week. Uh, or I should say there's been a lot of activity with high school students this week. Um, and the number that we are lo you know, looking into could potentially have us uh, discussing with Chester County Department of Health, you know, are we closing a grade level? Are we closing certain classrooms? It's going to be trickier at the high school because of the movement you know, throughout the building and the movement of throughout the building is necessary because you do not have one group of students who take all of the same, you know, have the same four blocks uh, all day long. Uh, so that makes it a little, a little bit, a little more challenging. But this week, um, there were a few on Monday, there were a few on Tuesday. And, and actually in our conversation on Tuesday, we were saying, would this be enough to have us now in looking at notifying people Tuesday night, if we were in session, that the high school would not be open on Wednesday? But we still have a lot more questions. Okay, so right now the recommendation is for district-wide to return to the hybrid model on December 9th. Is there a chance that as we're collecting more of the, the COVID case data pertaining to the different schools, that there would be an announcement prior to December 9th about the ability for each of the buildings to open to hybrid on December 9th? That could happen. Okay, thank you. Next up, Ari. Um, thank you. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rushi and your administration for uh, navigating Harrisburg. 
um, it doesn't look easy and um, you're changing on the fly. Just so the community knows, um, you could talk about opening and closing schools at your discretion in a snow day situation. So we already have a model where you have the authority, correct, to close school without board approval that for is a correct. snow day? Yes, Mr. Fleischer, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so it's not necessarily an unusual circumstance that um, is causing us to necessarily amend this plan. My question about amending the plan though is if it's at the state's urging or mandating that we close, why do we also need you to have permission? Mm -hmm. uh, because the state continues to say that it is a local decision, mm -hmm. um, and that th these are sort these are these are the guardrails by which we operate, and it is in Pennsylvania always a local decision. So, kind of talking out of both sides of their mouths, it sounds like well. consistently. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, and I'm really glad to hear you mention the mental health of our students when talking about um, activities and sports. Um, it's a very important aspect of what you and your staff do here at Haverford. They, you're not just educating children, ABCs and one, two, threes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, next up, Kristen. Thanks. Um, so Dr. Rushi, in one of your slides, um, you mentioned that the state said if in the event we need to close a school, um, that if contact tracing, cleaning, et cetera, can be done in a lesser amount of time, we could potentially open fast, reopen sooner. Um, but I'm also thinking back to our last meeting where we were discussing um, kind of the backlog in contact tracing. Um, and then related to that, just the burden that that is putting on district personnel and the resistance we are getting from some families and actually cooperating with the contact tracing process. Um, so I guess this is more a statement, but I just, you know, that's written in there that is state language that we could open sooner. But I mean, I think the reality on the ground is that given the contact tracing um, complexities mm -hmm. that we're probably gonna be looking at just meeting the, the, the recommended timeline as opposed to um, opening any sooner. Is that correct? or? Would that be your assessment as well? You're, you're spot on. That, that's that's a, an accurate assessment. That contact tracing will, will be important. You know, the cooperation in contact tracing will be important. Absolutely. Right, thanks. Next up, Antoinette. And nine months into this, and I'm still talking before hitting on mute. Um, so I, I think this was the, the way that you laid out was really helpful and I appreciate you um, doing this so quickly with, um, you know, nothing new came out from PDE today, um, I think, even though we're having a board meeting, so that's good. Um, so I, I have a question about the, the 14 day numbers. And I know we don't know everything about it yet, but I guess, um, because I think that the way that the district is reporting cases now is in a chart that's updated weekly is that right? Yes. Yes. It's um, up Sunday evenings. Okay. So I guess like with this being the 14 day rolling average or the 14 days rolling numbers, um, are we going to have something that is, that is put on the website every day so that people can see, you know, what happened. And I know that, you know, with contact tracing and things like that, it doesn't, it's not like someone was there and then, you know, you know, for certain that they were positive and they were contagious or anything like that. But I guess um, I, I think it might be helpful to have something that's updated more than weekly. And so I just wanted to know what the, the plan was for that. Um, we do know that we are going to need to have something. I mean, as as a parent myself, like I want to know, well, are we close to? Yeah, we, right. That's what I'm thinking too. How far away are, are we? Um, exactly how? You know, we don't have the specific, the, um, specific details of that worked out yet, other than to say we know that we need to do a little bit more. Um, on a reg on a basis beyond just Sunday evenings. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I think that'll be really helpful for people to sort of see. And and I think I mean I think folks need to keep in mind though too that if there was some sort of event that happened outside of school that maybe 
you know, there were a, a lot of folks at who are inside of our schools, um, you know, that those numbers could happen all in one event, all in one day. And so I think, you know, I don't think that people should put too much stock in, oh, we only have one case in our 14 mm -hmm. days um, mm -hmm. because, you know, the next day could, could have 10 that are all from some, I don't know, um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to speculate what folks are doing, but, you know, um, some, something like that. But, but I do think it would be helpful for people to just sort of see in more, more real time. Um, and then I, I, I am really happy we're talking about mental health and um, of our students. I think one thing that I've been increasingly concerned about um, is the mental health of our teachers and staff and how, um, how, how much I think that they are really putting in everything that they have to making the, the virtual work, the hybrid work, the in-person work um, and, and going above and beyond. And so I don't know um, what's possible that, 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 the district, that the district can do for them. Um, I know that um, we're constantly trying to say how appreciative we are and, and everything, um, but I, is there a way that we could um, make a break longer or something like that? I mean, we have winter break coming up. I think it's well-deserved for people um, and they really, really need it. And I think it's a week and a half maybe for, mm -hmm. for teachers. Um, you know, I don't need an answer tonight or anything, um, but I think that with how difficult this period is in teachers and staff's lives, um, I think it's, it's worth looking into to give um, some more time off. And I, that implicates a lot of things like snow days or, you know, not snow days, but, um, you know, days that we have required, required number of days, mm -hmm. required number of days and everything. Yeah. But I just, um, I think the burnout and the mental health is real. So um, something that I've been, I've been looking at and wanted to bring up. Um. So why don't we, you know, we can put our creative juices to work and, and see, see what we can, see what we can come up with. It but doesn't look like we're going to be using any snow days. How? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Antoinette. Next up, Dave. Hey there, Dr. Rushi, and I want to thank you, by the way, for clarifying that change of policy earlier, it, it's, and just to reiterate, so it's not a change in precedent, more as it, it's more of a response to the, I don't say contrary, but to the guidance that we're getting from the state along with the policy that's still a local decision. We're kind of trying, we're, we're kind of walking a tightrope here, it sounds like. Um, so the reason for this is not so much out of, it, it, it's more out of, a need to com to comply with these two tricky kind of uh, you know the the these tricky forms of guidance that we're getting. So I want to thank you for for, for clarifying that. And I just had one very quick question as well regarding uh, what was on the slides earlier. You mentioned the um, if there were a certain number of cases in schools, there'd be a fourteen day closure. The 14 day closure, um, do we know, and if you don't know, it's fine. Do we know, was that based on CDC's previous guidance of a two week quarantine? I don't know, Dave, what they based, you know, what they based that on. I, okay. I do want, to, I, if I could just say, you know, it's up to a 14 day. So, you know, it, it right. could be less, but but I, I don't know, you know, what they're basing that on. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, we have, uh, made the request and, and I believe she will be available, the um, director of Chester County Health Department to attend our December 17th meeting. Um, okay. Hopefully in the next two weeks, we'll get some more questions answered and, and she can answer any you know, remaining questions that we have. Sure, I mean, and, we'll, and, and, and through the way, you mentioned that there'd be an FAQ coming out fairly soon. We're hoping. Uh, what's that you're hoping? Um, we're, we're hopeful. Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, I'd like to know, I mean, if we could put the question up there to them, um, if we could just put one of the questions up, up there would be, you know, based on CDC's new guidance, could this change? I mean, yes. obviously, obviously they get left it open-ended already, but I mean, I, I just wanted to know if there was a way that we could put that up there just so we can get some more clarification on that, because a lot of these closures, you know, 
14 days, 10 days, it does make a difference in, in, in people's lives when they have to worry about childcare, and especially because we're going to be putting a lot of pressure on folks in a very short period of time. So it, this is, you know, the, the snow day analogy that Ari brought up, I think is very apt. <laughs> this is like a snow day, um, but it's for an extended period of time. It's for, you know, a blizzard of 94 type of snow day where you really have to, you know, um, um, make some, you know, make arrangements. So if we could get some more clarification, they probably won't, won't give us much, but if we put, put it out there, I think that would be- what We'll ask, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Could I just interject here? Um, sorry to, to jump in, but um, could you clarify if 14 days or any of the days that you're talking about, is that calendar days or school days? Like 14, 14 calendar days would be two weeks. 14 school days could be closer to three weeks. My, my initial response that I received is that it's 14 calendar days. Okay, thank you. Because I had asked if, if, if we were notified like on a Thursday that we needed to shut down for three days or something, could we count Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Mm -hmm. and, and the response was yes. Okay, good, thank you. Bridget, that's my last question. You beat me to it by, by about three seconds. So, 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 so thank you. My other question, calendar days or, yeah. or, or school days. So thank you. And that's, yeah, that, that's it for me, thanks. Kristen, you're up again. Um, I think Susan had her hand up, so I'm gonna defer to her and then come back to me. She okay. had it up before I did. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Dr. Rushi, I wanna talk about contact tracing because in my experience and what I'm listening to and reading, contact tracing is such an important piece of this. And it just seems to me in our schools, it's not that important a piece because we don't really, we have to kind of rely on our nurses, our secretaries, who are we relying on to make sure that we are contact tracing the best we can to make sure that this isn't being brought into the school? I find it complex. Uh, a lot of it does, as you said, a lot of it does fall to the nurses. I can tell you principals are involved with it. Uh, Nicole is here this evening. I don't know if Nicole, if you wanna talk about, like Nicole has talked with families. It's, it's an all hands on deck when you, you know when we're it's like whoever's available it, it, or in some instances who knows that family and might you might be able to get you know convince someone to share who the child was with so go ahead and hold sorry yes yeah, so it involves pretty much everyone we um our nurses we meet weekly and we go over you know contact tracing any questions they have they were trained um you know we met with the health department several times at the beginning of the the year as the guidance was changing, our contact at the health department would meet with um, myself and the nursing group to go over um, any questions we had. Um, and we have been continuing to meet weekly to make sure that we're up to speed on um, whatever the newest um, version of the guidance that comes out um, that we have from the health department. The principals are heavily involved in contacting families and um, making sure that we um, notify people who need to be in quarantine. Um, that we're getting information from families. Um, and then, you know, it's not just students and staff in schools. We have our maintenance department, our transportation department, food services. Um, so we've trained members of those um, departments um, in, you know, what the expectations are from the health department. Um, and we've met several times and, you know, they basically um, contact me for, um, scenarios and we walk through things and Mr. Parker is involved as well when it comes to staff. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a, you know, Process. a lot of people. Yep. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind Nicole, that Nicole is, is in charge of pupil services, which is in itself one of the biggest jobs I think we have. If we looked at a job description, it's monumental as it is. So not only is it special education, but it's also pupil services. So now we've asked you to take this on. We taken anything off of your plate, Nicole? Don't answer that. But that's what has happened. I believe it's happened with Jennifer Saska. She is now trying to work on next year's curriculum when she's still working with teachers to teach synchronously and how to do this, that, or the other thing with hybrid. Uh, we have Sarah who's trying to keep the Chromebooks online. So all of those people in the administration, your administration, Dr. Rucci, trying to keep us going 
while really kind of doing triple duty. I have to let them know how much I appreciate it. I think the contact tracing for me is is a biggest issue because I don't I worry that that important piece is getting lost because people won't talk about it. So I just feel like I would like the world to hear that if we don't know it, we can't help. Wear your mask. Thank you. Take care of your children. Yeah. Good job in the administration wing as and 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 Greg Parker's in HR too. Everybody's throwing it in. Everyone is. You, everyone. Yeah. Good job, Rob. Good job. Okay, so I have hands up from uh, Kristen and Laura. Um, thanks. So I just want to reiterate for the public that um, this new guidance from PDH or Department of Health and PDE, Department of Education, um, and the attestation letter that the district has signed on to. I mean, this, we need to follow these requirements in order to have any in-person learning at all. Like without um, signing on to this and agreeing to, you know, all the information Dr. Rushi shared this evening, we would not be able to do in person. We'd be 100% remote. Um, so I just want to make sure that, you know, the public understands that. Yeah. Um, looking at the new guidelines tonight in terms of, you know, cases and building sizes and timelines and whatnot, um, we've just taken a very fluid situation and it's become even more fluid. Um, so again, if it, it, yeah, it's, it's actually mind boggling. Um, and then added to that, we have 11,000 new COVID cases in PA today, 187 new deaths. Um, mainline health system is at capacity. Montgomery County is at or nearing capacity in their hospitals. And we have nine ICU beds left in Delaware County. And we have over 500,000 residents here. Um, I'm not trying to paint a glum, glum picture, but the picture is, it's grim. It is, it's scary out there. And what the district is trying to do within this context is truly remarkable. And I just, I really want people, the public to remember that, um, you know, our teachers, our administrators, um, you know, they have families too. They're dealing with this too. They're living these dark times as well. And they are trying to do everything they absolutely can to ensure that your children or our children have safe, um, meaningful learning opportunities in the face of all of this. And I know we can't make everyone happy 100% of the time. That was true in normal times, um, but it's even more so true now. Um, so again, I'm just kind of mind dumping here, but I, I just wanted to give a little bit more context to what we're working within and just ask for people to have, um, I know we're all under tremendous stress, but if you can just find it in your heart to have a little bit of compassion for what, um, our district staff members are up against. Thanks. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. Laura? Yeah, so I'm glad that we are going to have the staff and the um, ability to contact Trace and all of that to go back to um, a hybrid model as soon as possible, especially for full K to 12. Um, but given the numbers, I know that there are gonna be a lot of people that just aren't comfortable sending their kids back. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what alternatives do people have at this point where we're at in the academic calendar, if they are not comfortable returning to hybrid mm -hmm. on the ninth, assuming we approve it tonight. Um, and we will communicate to parents. I don't want to make a blanket statement, okay, right? But it's fine. It will be applicable for mm -hmm. every grade, you know, every grade. Mm -hmm. level. Sure. A lot of this is... Um, is, is more easily solved at the secondary level than it is the, than it is the element. And mm -hmm. so much of it has to do with availability. Uh, but, but we do know, Dr. Grispin, that that's one of the things that we need when we put communication out to families, we need to try and guide them. You know, if you are concerned about this, consider these options here. And we, you know, we, we want to be able to provide an education for all of our students. We don't want to see our students leaving us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess should parents then be looking for some kind of a communication prior to the ninth? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, yes. great. Yeah. Will be um, very general communication going out tomorrow to ensure that, mm -hmm. that everybody is, is at least aware of where they can continue to follow these changes and, and how they can get more information about it. And then more, uh, detailed specificity to follow at, at the beginning of the week. Okay, great. Thank you. 
You're welcome. I'm still showing hands up from uh, three people who already spoke. Is, is there anybody that hasn't had a chance to, to speak? Susan, are you good? I'm good, thanks. You know, I, I'd just like to mention that, you know, this latest uh, guidance, if you will, from the state, uh, we were, we, we got the heads up the day before the Thanksgiving holiday started. Um, and this uh, attestation document that Dr. Rushi and I had to sign that uh, allowed us to continue in hybrid as opposed to being 100% virtual, as Kristen mentioned, had to be signed by uh, close of business on Monday. So this whole scenario is something that, uh, you know, that happened in relatively short order uh, over the four day holiday weekend. Um, you know, f as you're hearing, you know, all the aspects of this tonight, I, I know we'd all like for things to be uh, more stable and less fluid. Um, but unfortunately, it's the environment that, uh, that we're living in. Um, we're doing the best we can. Um, as we've said all along, you know, the safety of our students and our staff is paramount. Uh, under the circumstances, we're trying to do the best we can uh, with all aspects of our children's education. Um, you know, we, we heard a lot of kudos from the board uh, for, for uh, staff uh, and, and our administration this evening. And that by no means diminishes uh, our understanding of the burden that this has placed on, on parents and families. Um, and you know, we just have to hunker down and hang in there. Uh, any other questions for Dr. Rushi on this topic? Okay. I will look forward to a meeting where I can talk about another topic. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, next item is for information purposes only, secretary to submit for insertion into the minutes, proof of publication regarding the legal notice advertising, the request for food service management bid proposals. Likewise, the secretary to submit for insertion into the minutes proof of per publication regarding the special school board meeting that was scheduled for November 23rd, 2020. Uh, with that, I'll accept the motion to approve disbursements from the general fund totaling $936,870.05. Fleischer move. It's been second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I'll accept the motion to accept the recommendation of the new Linwood Elementary School Project Architect, KCBA and Associates, Inc., and owner's representative, CB Development Services, Inc., and authorize the change orders as listed. Words moved. Second, Minji. Moved and second, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept the motion to approve the facilities use agreement with the Greater Philadelphia YMCA for use of the YMCA Nanatorium for swim team practices and meets at a cost not to exceed eleven thousand three hundred dollars. Motion moves. Second. <coughs> Moved and second. Any discussion? Uh, I, Do we I, get? Sorry. Go ahead, Ari. Oh, sorry, Internet. Do we get any money back if we can't use the pool? Same question. The lease did, or the agreement did have um, that provision in it on a per diem to be able to be reimbursed. But um, yeah, my question was um, similar to that. Just, you know, how how likely is it that we'll be able to work that out and have that flexibility 
as these day by day kind of changes come up. I can just chime in. The YMCA did uh, say that we would get money back, but they did. They do have a, uh, an agreement where you have to pay everything up front. So it's it's I guess a good faith agreement that that we're working on. But they did. I think we're only paying half of it in a deposit. I think so. Yeah. Um, so if if we get shut down tomorrow then we have to get the money back, you know? So we're, we're hoping that, um, and, and it is, believe it or not, is significantly cheaper than the pool we uh, normally use. I think the deposit's 5,000, right, Bob? Yes, yes. And uh, you get credits for days that uh, we would, on the schedule that we don't use. So I think they're ready to start right away. Uh, so if, say, they couldn't go, uh, we would actually get credits for those days that we didn't attend because of, of no fault of our own. Like if we if we cancel, but if it's because of the coronavirus, uh, I think we get a credit back those days. Um, yeah, I think the lease or the agreement even started on December 1st, so these first couple of days of December, um, I think the sports haven't been practicing so we'll already be um, putting those requests for, <laughs> for for rate of reimbursement into effect. Um, I was also going, also going to ask um, I know this is a different swimming uh, arrangement than we've had in the past um, with specified hours and use and different rules. Um, is it a significant constraint on um, our swim team's typical practice schedule and, and um, also with the 10 person limit, how does that affect the Y or the swim team um, in that facility compared to like the basketball team in our own gym? Uh, swimming is slightly different than our own gym and, and the this, this sport, you know, is a little bit different, uh, but it, it does hamper their normal. I mean, our swim team is pretty good. And we, we have, the sad part is we have also um, about, we could have 50 kids on, on the boys side and 50 on the girls side. And then Mr. Stewart, our coach does a wonderful job of uh, including students who uh, are in the special Olympics on our team too. Um, so he, he, they have to pod like everybody else. And it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not the way it was, but they're making the best they can out of it. I wish them luck with all of the constraints. I, I had a um, question. Where, where, where does the team usually um, practice in normal years? Normally we're at the, the Hafford School and uh, the Hafford School uh, based on their restrictions couldn't allow us to go or some other private schools to use their facility also. They weren't allowed to use their facility so uh, um, so it wasn't just a, an us thing. They've been pretty good to us over the years. Um, and I think you said this, but this is at least comparable to what it normally is, the, the price. Well, yes, and no, the price is a little bit cheaper, but we're obviously the use isn't as much. The overall price that we budget is a little bit cheaper. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board on this item? Mr. Donahue gave us a new verb tonight, to pod. <laughs> now the kids have to pod. <laughs> a whole new meaning. Thank you, Pete. All um, in favor? I'm just wondering quickly how our health and safety plan will be followed um, at the Y, just being that it's a, a facility outside of the district um, in terms of masking. I'm thinking about, you know, locker yeah. room use and Any. swimming. So you kind of need to have a locker room. <laughs> well, they, they don't. They they're they have to come right in, uh, go right to the deck. Uh, when they're on the deck, they, they've already worked this out too. Uh, they have to have their mask on when they're about to jump into the pool. They take their mask off when they get out of the pool. They have to put their mask back on. So, and they're wet. And yeah, there's a lot that of uh, planning that uh, Mr. Stewart and Miss Robinson are putting into uh, how that's all going to work. Um, but they they aren't using uh, the locker room. 
as as of right now. Okay. Yep. Any other comments at this point? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. I'll accept the motion to approve David Blackmore and Associates Inc. to provide geotechnical and construction quality control services for the high school renovation project phase one at a cost of $27,762 as recommended by owner's representative CB Development Services Inc. Motion moves. Larson second. Moved and second, any discussion? Um, um, all right, I just have a quick question about this because I, I think that Ken mentioned it tonight, um, but was were um, the, the bids and things like that reviewed by the facilities um, liaisons or was this, this is just something that... Um, it's something that Ken would do as owner's rep. Okay. Ken, Ken as owner's rep got, uh, got the proposals that same with Linwood and because it's professional service really, it does not have to go out to a formal bid, but uh, he did do the, his due diligence on and you know, and his expertise are, you know, important in making that decision, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we had a move and second, but we haven't voted yet, correct? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, motion carries. I'll accept a motion to accept the retirement as listed. Larson moves. Pleasure moves. Seconds. Moved and second. Any discussion? Um, can I just have a word about um, Ms. Selman? She came to Haverford the year I went up into the administrative wing and she came as an emotional support teacher and none of it, we did never have one. So she spent a few years defining herself and became one of the best social skills teachers uh, we have ever seen. She has worked in all five elementary schools and she works with children uh, that just need a little bit of help in getting through their day. She does a wonderful job. I congratulate her on a job well done and I'm sorry to see her go. So thank you, Karen. You're here. Thank you, Susan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept a motion to approve the appointments as listed. Not Chris moved. Crispin second. Moved and second. Discussion. Thanks for stepping up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good number of them. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept the motion to approve the leave requests as listed. Larson moved. Crispin second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Um, I'm just saying that this is a long list. Um, and I also see that it includes FFCRA um, related to the CARES Act. Um, I guess my question is with these leaves of absence, which people are fully entitled to take, um, how is this impacting our staffing? Do we, is, are the appointments that we just approved, are they covering um, you know, this need? Um, just, I, I'm not used to seeing so many names on our list. Um, and I'll, I'll let Mr. Pro go ahead, Greg. <laughs> so my, my first response would be that uh, not all of these leaves that are listed here are necessarily very long leaves. Sometimes they're a couple of days, but sometimes they are a full uh, two week quarantine period uh, under the FFCRA. Uh, and sometimes they're childcare uh, leaves under FFCRA that are even longer than that. Uh, but we're not, I wouldn't say that the appointments match up with these leaves. And you're gonna see a couple more board meetings with long lists because we're, we're catching up. I mean, the paperwork is immense uh, and we're trying to keep pace when, and keep payroll informed, uh, but we're making sure that we have the, you know, the, the documentary uh, 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 evidence of the FFCRA need. 
and um, and then we we bring it to you for approval. And you'll see some other long lists. Um, but it is part of what has been impacting our staffing. I mean, there's no way around it. Uh, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I know Dr. Rushi had some things to say, but clearly it's part of what we've been struggling with. Uh, uh, but there's not a lot of choice. If someone is quarantined or isolated uh, or is entitled to childcare leave, uh, uh, then uh, we have to try to fill in you know, the best we can. Um, and everybody is working together uh, to, to get that done. Principals, staff, uh, and frankly, a lot of the staff that you see here, I mean, they've, they've kept their leave as short as they can, I think. Uh, I've seen evidence of it to, to try to, you know, they're, if it's childcare, they, they sometimes only use it for a brief period of time when they have no other choice, um, and then they come back. Uh, so I hope that at least partially answers the question. And, I'll let Dr. Rushi okay. add whatever she might. No, I'm I'm good, Greg. Thank you. I had a couple of questions about the FFCRA as well. One is um, I've heard examples of uh, people maybe using it for consecutive Wednesdays for childcare coverage or or things like that with some flexibility. Is is that something that we've been able to do to accommodate staff, but also you know keep keep them working as, as much as possible. Yeah, that can be complicated because it's not necessarily clear that intermittent leave on some of these leaves is available, but, but face facts, we have been making some allowances to try to keep staffing in place. And uh, so uh, we try to work with folks when there's necessity and it will keep instruction going. Um, uh, Just to uh, offer that there's, um, you know, there's the time that they're taking leave, but also um, it is, it could be seen as a tool or a resource to accommodate, um, to continue that involvement of the staff person. Um, right, right. And, and, and I'll also add just briefly that, um, you know, amongst all the other changes, and you've heard about all the different changes that get passed down from various levels of government and and uh, public health agencies to us, um, even the FFCRA has changed along the way since it was first first put in place. And so, it's a special provision for for hybrid leave. And then we have to try to figure out wherever folks have their children in school or or other care when that schooling or, or uh, care may not be available or when the schools are closed on a hybrid basis, like, like we are. Uh, and in fact, some of our staff, you know, their children go to our schools. So we have to then try to figure out, you know, what that leave looks like. And that's another case where it ends up really being intermittent leave, even though, you know, the, the lawmakers say, you know, no, that's not really intermittent leave. Well, it's sure to everybody that I know and all the legal experts and including the council that we consult, it looks like intermittent leave, but that's another complication that we have to deal with. And if indeed they qualify for it, then we have to arrange it. Uh, uh, right, and another administrative support to navigate these challenging times. Um, my other question was about the duration of the FFCRA. Is it correct that it, um, it sunsets at the end of this month? That is correct. Uh, and so if somebody puts in for this kind of leave, say on December 15th, could it carry beyond um, 2020 or will all of the leaves that are currently approved also end on December 31? My understanding is that the entitlement to FFCRA leave expires on 12-31-2020 unless extended. Uh, and there is certainly some discussion about whether that's going to occur or not in some form. Currently, it has not been extended. Any other questions or comments regarding this item? All in favor? Aye. No. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept the motion to approve the amendment to the school district of Haverford Township health and safety plan as discussed. Larson moved. 
Read them in second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I'll accept the motion. Hang on, bear with me for a minute here. I'll accept the motion to approve the following. After a review of COVID-19 data, along with staffing needs and resources in the district, the Board of School Directors approves the return to the hybrid mode of instruction for all students starting Wednesday, December 9th, 2020, and authorizes the administration to take all necessary steps to implement the hybrid mode of instruction starting December 9th, 2020. Fleischer moved. Sure, second. Fleischer second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Board reports. Antoinette? Thanks. Yeah. Um, admittedly, I think our middle schooler stole mine from <laughs> this week. Um, so she so wonderfully said, I think, um, what I wanted to say, um, which is that I think that a lot of people are feeling a lot of COVID fatigue, and that's true across the board. Um, but I don't think that we should let it um, infect our discourse that we're having. And I would just really implore people to um, approach things with the mindset that everyone here and in general, I think, um, has good intentions. And everyone is looking to do the best thing that they can by our students and our staff and our community. And so I think at the beginning of the pandemic, when we all thought it was going to be a couple of weeks, um, it was a lot easier to have compassion and um, to try and approach things with kindness. And I just want to really implore folks to try and continue to do that. And it's really difficult um, because I think everyone has their own stresses. Um, but it's, it's important um, up here on this Zoom, even though we're in boxes, we're all people. And, um, you know, on the district, the emails that you get come from real people who will stay up at night trying to make all of this work. Um, so, you know, keep, keep that in mind. And um, on a positive note, hopefully um, the vaccines are coming. And, um, you know, it's, I think I read that it's, uh, there's light at the end of a long dark tunnel. <laughs> Um, but so that's, that's where we are. And, um, so thank you to our middle schooler, um, I, Zoe for, um, for saying all of this in a, a much better way than I could. Thanks Antoinette. Well said. Ari? Larry, you in the past have, um, mentioned that there was a school district countywide Zoom call about the reassessment. You asked me to take that over and um, liaise for Haverford. So I just wanna quickly report that I participated in my first meeting last uh, Tuesday and they're on a little bit of a hiatus for the holidays while they work on some things. But basically um, the whole gist of it is still the same as you maybe have told us before regarding the shift in um, real estate values from commercial to residential. And that is an issue countywide that is being looked at. Um, maybe since you participated, a couple of county commissioners have been added to the call. There are school district representatives from all over the county working on this issue uh, and looking at ways that the reassessment could possibly be improved either through um, a county action or a legal action. So I'll keep everyone updated on uh, future Zoom calls and thank you for asking me to participate. Thanks for taking that on Ari, much obliged. Next, uh, Dave. Yeah, uh, thanks, just to provide a quick ray of hope here. I, uh, we get all the emails and, and, and we hear from folks who have indicated how much of a burden virtual learning is and Glad you're moving back to the hybrid mode and just, you know, to 
to put the hope out there, last month, you know, while cases in the community were rising, transmission in our schools was still extraordinarily low. Now, I'm glad we took the, this two week break after Thanksgiving just to make sure that after the holidays, you know, things could, could you know, you know, abundance of caution. I'm glad that we did that. But just to give the community a bit of, a, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a ray of hope here. If we can keep transmission rates down as we have been, it's showing that what that the policies in 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 schools are is working. Uh, the the policies in place are working. We have very low transmission rates. So you know, don't despair. It's you know, it, if we keep it up, and it's especially one of the big things that Dr. Ru that Dr. Um, Rushi has mentioned in the past. Parents have played a big role in that. If their students are feeling ill, if they have a fever, if they have any symptoms, they keep them home. And that has been a huge role. I know everybody's suffering, as I just mentioned, from COVID fatigue, but please still be diligent. That has been a huge reason why our hybrid program, I, I think so far, has been successful and why I, th I think it will be up until hopefully we get that vaccine or multiple vaccines. Thanks. Next up, Kristen. Yeah, um, so I had a rare treat today. I got to meet with a Brownie troop um, from Chestnut Walled. They are working on their democracy badge. And one of their requirements was to meet with a female elected um, representative. So um, they wanted to talk to me and it was such a great time. Um, got to talk to them about what it entails to run for school board and they had so many questions. They were so excited. Um, you know, some of them were talking about running for president. Um, that some of them want to run for school board themselves. Um, they're learning about the voting process, the branches of government. Um, it was just so exciting. And our discussion was the last piece of their badge requirements. So they will have their democracy badge. Um, so yeah, just, you know, getting energy from the kids and it was a great experience. That's great. You know, I've had opportunities over the years to, you know, work with uh, Boy Scouts who are you know, on a similar assignment. And it's always been uh, a, a real nice thing to be able to do. So good for you. Next up, Laura. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to keep it short. Um, Giving Tuesday was this week. And I know that the Haverford Township Education Foundation COVID Relief Fund is still ongoing. Um, and they are, you know, still accepting donations and working with social workers in our district um, to raise money for anybody in our district that's um, impacted by COVID. So if you're looking for a place to put your money for Giving Tuesday, even though today is Thursday, um, it's never too late to donate to the Education Foundation. They do great stuff for um, families in our district. So thanks. Great. Thanks, Laura. Sal? Uh, Kristen, the next time you meet with the Brownie Troop, you have to bring attestation forms that they all sign so that they can get their badge. <laughs> like, do you still want to run for school board? Yeah, no. right. Uh, no report. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Susan. Kristen said energy from the kids. Tonight, the meeting started with those seniors, um, and that gave us energy. Just happy to see them. Of course, our representatives are wonderful, but for me, it's always about the kids. And I love seeing them. It's what I miss the most about Zoom. So thank you for bringing them on. It was, a, it was just great to see them. And that's it, no report. Thank you, Larry. Bridget. Uh, everyone's kind of touched on some of the topics I was gonna say. Yeah, I loved seeing the, the seniors and, and to get that special recognition and um, just to implore everyone to, um, you know, I think at this point in the conversation we've had about, um, you know, this board is committed and the, and the administration is committed to having in-person education, but so much of our ability to do that is based on the community's response to COVID and the safety measures and the distancing and the mask wearing. Um, I think we will soon have a very real experiment to see how our numbers um, relate to our ability to keep the, the hybrid model going. Um, so in these next uh, couple days or week before the December 9th return to school, um, I hope everyone prioritizes that keeping the safe, keeping safe so that we can 
keep our kids in school. Um, but I also do have a business item to report. One of the items earlier on the agenda was just the notice about the food services manager program. Um, that was a request for proposals that had been um, sent out in the middle of November and the bids came back in um, early in December and uh, several of us met today. I met as a board um, finance liaison uh, representative and then met with Bob Regal and Kevin Kieser and um, Mr. Dunnegy, Mr. Haran and Mr. Ramundos as um, principals to um, review five bids that came in for the food services manager position. Um, these are all companies, some big players like Aramark and Chartwells, and then uh, there's also Mets Nutrition and as SFE. Um, and the proposal is so that a food services manager um, would work with our district food services staff, um, but add a professional management, um, an executive chef, and bring some purchasing power. Um, the state uh, outlines the steps for the RFP and then also our review and potential selection of a food services manager. Um, so we met today. The applications that came in are like, like hundreds of pages <laughs> long, um, but uh, the business department helped give us a, a working framework. Um, so we're going to be scoring the applications on cost, service capacity, personnel management, experience, quality, promotion, um, and student and staff involvement. Um, we're going to be getting the preliminary scores uh, early next week so that the finance liaisons can um, review the um, scoring and the proposals at our meeting next Thursday. And um, we'd also like to get um, some presentations from the maybe top scoring companies. Unfortunately for, you know, with pandemic, we wouldn't be able to um, get them in to give us a sample of their, <laughs> their lunch selections or to have a buffet like we were told that they might do um, to wow us um, in other, um, other times, but we will try to, uh, you know, get a good sense of what the companies would be like to work with and what they would have to offer because the goal is really to um, improve the financial uh, viability of our food services program, that kind of business line that we saw in the audit tonight that has um, suffered losses the last couple of years, but to um, generate uh, positive operations through um, increased participation or lunch purchasing because of um, the ability of this professional services company to come in and, and help us make a more attractive lunch program that, um, that kids participate in more. Um, so there'll be more on that to come, but just wanted to let you know that that process was kicked off. Thank you, Bridget, and thanks for taking that on. The board met in executive session prior to the public meeting to review tax assessment appeal litigation with legal counsel and a pending contractual grievance matter. Our annual school board reorganization meeting is scheduled to be held at 6 p.m. on December 7th, 2020 via Zoom. Our next regular public board meeting is scheduled to be held on December 17th, uh, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. And with that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Good night, everybody. Thank you all very much for this long evening and for covering all the We had a wide range of topics this evening. Busy board night. Did, board did some, some good work. Administration kept us busy. So thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks. Have Thank a good you. Night. Yeah, have good, good night, night everyone. Good night. Good night, Katie. She hung in there till the end. How about that? <laughs>